It is already three PM. I think which I should start with everyone's permission. Yes, please do. Okay. Let me share my screen. Is my screen visible? It's sharing. Not yet. It's still screen sharing. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. okay. I think it's stuck again. My laptop is stuck again. I'm, I'm just fixing it. Can you introduce, please? Yes, we'll do. Sure. We'll do. Sure. Warm welcome to each and every one of you from I Can Care today on this uh, second session of this third edition of the e-conclave. In just a few minutes, we'll start. There's a little technical glitch. But we really thank you all for being here and making this a success year after year. This is the third edition today. This, this particular year of 2023, we are on our third edition. And we thank you all for your active participation in every way possible, both as faculty, participants, adding knowledge, sharing knowledge, and taking things ahead in the correct direction together. We have over 800 registrations for this event, and uh, we do have some, about 200 plus would be joining here probably, and then we have live streamed. You can see that the sessions are being live streamed both on Facebook as well as YouTube. So we have large number of viewers on these platforms also. I'm um, absolutely so sorry, I had lost connectivity for a couple of minutes, I'm back. I'm just sharing uh, my screen again. I'm so sorry about the technical glitch. Let me share my screen quickly. I think it's now visible. Yes, Shruti. 
Thank you, ma'am. So, warm good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of the third I can get international e conclave on oral cancer. The theme for the entire episodes is do it, but do it right. And we're on day two. First day was we understood about how to diagnose the oral lesions and adopt the metrology, how to treat them right, absolutely in a perfect manner. Today's theme on oral lesions and how we should have a in good intervention care to ensure that patients actually have better uh, inputs to their treatment and diagnosis and management overall. I would really like to thank all the partnering organizations who have been tirelessly working with us to make this event absolutely successful. Triscare, Icon Foundation, Strategic Institute of Public Health, Dantpari, uh, uh, Pushpagiri College, Orzanmon, Jelnova, Tripada, Azura, and Bareilly International University. I'm absolutely thankful to all these organizations who have really made this successful. As a statutory warning uh, and a note to everyone, just ensure that you keep your microphones on mute. Only the speakers will be allowed to speak while the sessions are on. Raise your hands if you need anything. To uh, The moderators will get in touch with you. In case you have any questions, please ensure that you put down on the chat box. The faculty will answer all those questions. And in case something is left out, we'll get back with the answers to you very shortly. It would be also available on the website uh, for your knowledge. This, being, uh, this session is being recorded and is also being uh, telecasted on multiple social media, social media platforms. So please ensure that all the videos are in the perfect mode. It is, uh, in case uh, you are not using the video in the, cam uh, in the on mode, please put it off. Uh, another thing which is very important to notice here is that the academic chair, Dr. Reena Arkumar and convener for the program, Dr. Pawan Gupta, will have the overriding rights in the entire session while, uh, uh, while, mod while moderation, while the transition. Thank you so much. In this uh, particular conclave, we have introduced for the first time post, uh, sorry, the student paper presentation, and I invite all the participants to put down the papers to us uh, 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 in three categories, which is mentioned here. It is available, uh, the, uh, the submissions are open till 20th of April. We are going to stop it in the evening at 6 p.m. The theme is on oral cancer. Anything related to oral cancer, do it, but do it right is the theme. So it can be original research or a clinical or a review category. So all the participants who are watching us on different media platforms, please ensure that you make the submissions before 20th of April. We have the quiz competition. The first episode is already over last time. We have the second one today, which is, which is going to happen shortly after the scientific session at 4 p.m. So stay tuned for the competition uh, in the evening. We are now heading towards our uh, scientific sessions. So we have three esteemed speakers uh, for the evening, three very diligent and uh, prolifically talented faculty with us today who are going to talk about exclusive topics uh, in front of you. So the theme is again oral lesions and intervention care. And now I invite uh, Dr. Rajmari Khatri. Madam is uh, the moderator for the scientific sessions today. She is a certified tobacco cessation specialist uh, from Gujarat University, also the honorary, uh, honorary ENT and laser consultant at Indian Institute of Head and Neck Oncology. She's been awarded with numerous awards, the Lifetime Achievement Award, the National Mahila Ratan Award, Jewel of India Award, achievement in the field of medical education, invited a speaker on, uh, at the various webinars, national and international levels, and a lot of uh, publications to her name. So ma'am, it is all over to you. So please take ahead the scientific sessions. And please unmute yourself. Good noon, uh, everyone, and all my faculties and I can get team congratulations for a successful I day one program. And today we are in the marathon of the second day. Today is the oral lesion and its intervention. We have got uh, wonderful faculties. In the last day, we have diagnosed and treat and manage. Today we are working with the intervention, how to do early diagnosis. As we have seen, the oral cancer is making our India as a capital for the head and neck cancer. And it's very important to reduce the mortality and morbidity, early intervention, and early diagnosis. For this, we have a, today a wonderful session of early intervention, early diagnosis, and having intervention and prevention of the oral cancers. Very eminent faculties are with there. And for this first, we had to, I'm asking for chairing the session, Dr. Dikpal Dharkar, sir, who is the surgical oncologist with a vast experience. And um, can you share the screen for them, Shruti? He is a surgical oncologist, founder and honorary secretary of Indoor Cancer Foundation. 
He has received the first Padma Bhushan Professor S K Mukherjee Award in 1990 for the dedication commitment in the field of medicine pertaining to cancer, as well as the Madhya Pradesh Gaurav Award in 2002. In 1994, he was awarded as a fellowship for the from the Government of India to visit Russia for training in laser surgery. Asia Pacific region to be selected as a for the Asia Pacific Award by the International Union Against Cancer Geneva in 2002. In July 2019, he was then the President of India, uh, Mrs. Pratibha Patel, has presented a citation to Dr. Gopal Dakrasar at Rashtrapati Bhavan, and uh, Nargis Dutt Foundation of New York gave him the Dr. Dharkar. the lifetime service achievement award in 2011 and he has received various international fellowship and visited a couple of years in the foreign countries i would like dr dikpal dhar sir to chair the session dr dikpal dhar sir please can you hear me yes can you sir. hear me yes sir yes sir okay. welcome sir I'm welcome chairing this session and i would like to thank all of you from the high can care for uh, giving me the privilege to chair the session and uh, i think i would like the first speaker to proceed i think i have, can i can we go ahead with the first presentation please yes sir next slide please we have got today the first uh, scientific session the role of deep learning and artificial intelligence in the oral cancer by none other than dr pravin berog he is a uh, prince vice principal and professor head of the department in oral medicine and radiology in kle society institute of dental science bangalore he is consultant in biocon foundation and adjunct research scientist at mazumdar shah cancer center presently leading oral control cancer program empowering the health workers in the rural area he is a principal investigator in nih grant research on the low cost mobile oral cancer screening and low resource setting he has reached to the for working with the artificial intelligence for the early detection and prevention of oral cancers and sustaining act for the uh, module sustainable model and work extensively with the general dentist and non professional health care workers for the early detection of oral cancer and its prevention and he has a contribution to find the diagnosing new diagnostic and framing conscious guidelines and the author textbook i am inviting dr pravin berum sir please you are most welcome thank you thank you so much for the kind introduction it's my pleasure to be here for i can i care uh, honorable moderator as well as the uh, session moderator uh, for, for providing me this opportunity to be here so i'll quickly run through about 15 minutes of uh, uh, i was given the role of deep learning and artificial intelligence but this will cover more of translational rather than the engineering core of it um, kindly excuse me with uh, with uh, due permission from the moderator and the chairperson i have few submissions in due this weekend so i'll be leaving immediately after my talk and any questions i just request you to permit the audience to do it after my presentation rather than waiting for the end of the session i hope yeah, that yes. is okay and, yeah, and my yes. sincere apologies for not holding till the end of the session so i'll quickly run through the translational part of um, ai and deep learning thank you ma'am thank you for the per 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 uh, permission to take the questions at the end of it so our approach uh, in our cancer control program um, is to look at the potentially malignant disorders and reach the last mile with the healthcare workers so we do run a primary prevention and secondary prevention primary prevention um, if anybody is interested there's an interesting program of a 7 days program which includes field visits visit to basic laboratory ai ml training as well as a bit of a statistics that's in and around bangalore uh, uh, positioned in bangalore but the field visit will be around the rural bangalore rural secondary prevention is where the technology enabled uh, mobile health which we have been there for more than a decade um we are focusing now more on surveillance and detection that's where the two components which i would like to cover today will be on imaging and cytology uh, especially to the title of artificial intelligence and machine learning so 
The screening part is a mobile-based technology uh, way back uh, started in uh, 2009. It has an electronic medical record where it captures the risk factor and images. And presently we are working on the surveillance of those images. The detection part is where we are come with the adjuncts. Adjuncts are which are non-invasive, can be used by a semi or a low skilled. And obviously it has to be cost effective. Two components, as I mentioned earlier, which I'm going to cover will be the imaging and the cytology part, which has already translated. And both these approaches as an artificial intelligence to, to get a point of care uh, diagnosis at the time of screening. So this is where we stand. Every one cancer patient has about 30 potentially malignant disorders, easily accessible, but most often missed. So that's how we do the outreach. This is across India, uh, more in the Northeast region where the disease burden is very high. The trained healthcare workers captures the images and sends for the diagnosis. So the first learning of this approach way back in 2010, 2011, uh, it, it proved that it increased the efficiency when it was empowered in a telemedicine module. Optimization was required and they did look at the non-invasive approach if can address the early diagnosis in a more, more evidence-based. So you don't need a diagnosis of a lesion like this. These are pretty much evident. Patient himself will be reporting as a cancer. So the most important is to carry the lesions like this. And once you get these lesions, now what do I do next? The red, red and white component, where do they stand? Into, yeah, this is a frank malignancy or still a potentially malignant disorder in an outreach, even in a nodal centers, the biopsy is always a challenge. So in us, the uh, telemedicine is about 48 hours turnaround, turnaround time to give the provisional diagnosis. The module has been very successful. The images are very, very diagnostics. The accuracy of a remote and an on-site is about 96%. You can see all the references down the slide. But if you look at the sensitivity when a healthcare worker to diagnose was about 75, which obviously is not very well accepted to an outreach program. So that's when the research part got into it. You have reached more than 70,000 population, 14% of potentially malignant disorders. Uh, very proud to be that we have generated data uh, for the Northeast, especially in Nagaland. That's for the first paper they had a data on oral cancer, sorry. So uh, with the uh, when the cancer is detected, it goes out of the telemedicine module because it gets referred to the hospital and essentially it runs through a tertiary center always. So then the huge burden of potentially malignant disorders is an issue. So we looked at a tool which, which helps the health, healthcare worker to arrive at a diagnosis and look at a surveillance. So the best available diagnostic tool is a vital staining, Cochrane database, meta-analysis about 84% sensitivity. So whatever tool, whatever technology is a deep learning, machine learning, we thought we need to get around this or about this to make it more effective and have, an, have an enough evidence to prove that this works. The key point which I would like to tell this audience, especially when the machine learning comes is, see, the machine is uh, learning what the data you've given. The machine is more accurate to diagnose normal and cancer in a spectrum of an uh, cancer journey. Now, you, basically for both normal and cancer, I think most of the trained dentists will be able to do. The, the crux of the problem is to differentiate benign and OPMTs. So I strongly encourage to look into this uh, meta-analysis and systematic review, uh, which very clearly says the accuracy when it is squamous cell carcinoma versus non-dysplastic of most of the diagnostic adjuncts available goes about 90s. The moment you differentiate between potentially malignant and non-dysplastic, it falls around 75. So this is the problem. So if you are doing a cancer control program, diagnosis of cancer is much easier. The diagnosis and further management of a precancerous or a potentially malignant disorder is very essential if to prevent the disease burden. So this was the first application uh, from Indian Institute of Science uh, developed uh, with an uh, CNN, convolution neural network. So you capture an image, it throws up the diagnosis. F1 score at test accuracy about 70%. It has improved about 80 odd, but in, when I test with an independent test data, it does come down. So it, it obviously not a great tool to take it to the field. The next one which we came is with the fluorescence imaging. The fluorescence imaging basically look at the dysplastic cells. 
uh, fluorescent visualization loss is considered to be a dysplastic cells. Look at the literature, it is criticized heavily. I'll come to that part of it. Let's do what we did. This is how we capture the images. These are all phone-based captures. So you get an, all the loss of fluorescence. These are the dysplastic areas. You can very clearly delineate the lesions. You can look at the fluorescence loss as well as the gain. This is submucous fibrosis, which is more prevalent in our part of country. And of course, few of those uh, benign lesions like fibromas, abthacelsis. Now, these are the confounding factors of the fluorescence imaging. Now, when there is an heme, it does show loss of fluorescence, which machine interprets as dysplastic. Now, the, what's the critical point in this you have to understand is you need to understand where do we delineate it. Now, here the classification was to diagnose suspicious as potentially malignant and cancer, non-suspicious and benign and now normal. So this was the triaging, triaging at a low level. And in case if the machine doesn't learn well and pick some of the benign under suspicious is pretty much okay in an outreach program, not at a clinical setup. I hope I'm clear with this. I'll be more happy to take questions on this. So this is published in Nature. Accuracy about 88% when a cloud is connected. And all the uncertainty of 12 to 15% is still under a remote diagnosis by a specialist. So the patient care is not compromised. So healthcare worker takes a, uh, images, uploads to the cloud, and the cloud-based network gives a diagnosis. It's about 88% accuracy versus 92% if a specialist looks at it. So this is the, one of the <laughs> largest data set we have in the globe of both fluorescence and auto. Uh, white light imaging, but do, do remember that triaging is just yes or no, it doesn't do much more than that. And fluorescence imaging, to be frank, it is do criticized for its inherent limitations of picking up some of the non-dysplastic also as dysplasia. Now, if you look at well scope or anything, it has not gone up because these images needs interpretation. It is not diagnostic, these are adjuncts. Adjuncts is which helps in the specialist or a dentist. So you need some amount of understanding to interpret those images. They are not readily available. That's what the AI has done, has made a bit of a difference. This has been taken to the field. Now, these are the few of the images uh, where the AI has set suspicious. These are the loss of fluorescence. Histopathology confirms moderately differentiated squamous skull carcinoma. Lichen planus with dysplasia. These are the loss of fluorescence images. This is very interesting with of a gingivitis that AI said suspicious and histopathology showed that it is a malignant lesion. And this is where you come into picture some of the, this uh, the specialist said it is benign, but histopathology mucoepidermoid, AI said suspicious. So that, that's where it, it, it uh, gains the importance. But the white light, sometimes it does, doesn't pick the uh, malignant lesions. So hence this, this white light is still not taken to the field. And you have these inherent problems of the, the picking up the benign. This is a mucosal, which is taken as an uh, as an suspicious lesion. So that's this what I'm telling. Fluorescence might not be as accurate as that. Sorry, I'm not able to move my slide. Yeah. So this is again a fibroepithelial hypoplasia, which AI said suspicious. So there is a part of uh, uh, benign being picked as suspicious, but at the level of a screening. When in outreach, if it's over diagnosis, I think this might be pretty much acceptable, about 88% accuracy. Presently, we are looking at normogram, developing a surveillance module, looking at the image intensity. So this is the next research where the surveillance module will come up. These are the few cases which are followed, they're annotated. You look at the change in the intensity level and follow with the histopathology diagnosis. The next important, which I'll probably take another two, three minutes, is to differentiate high-grade dysplasia from low-grade dysplasia. All the patients who have been screened positive to so undergo his, uh, um, his cytology, because biopsy rate is very low, the patient compliance for an invasive procedure is low. So here what we do in this process is uh, it's a molecular cytology, two patented molecules of uh, uh, SNA1 and CD44. You do the scrapings. This is from the Welcome Trust grant. Um, so this to differentiate low grade from benign and high grade from cancer. So there it was, yes or no, from potentially malignant to cancer. Here the differentiating factor is low grade benign versus high grade cancer because then we put it this as a high risk group. So sensitivity is about 92%. 
The machine learning does the cell segmentation. So once you do a cytology, put the molecular marker, run it to the fluorescent microscopes. Manual method of segmentation is very difficult. So get an automated, extract this, each cell's features. 16 cell features are extracted with SNA intensity and DAP is more favorable for the uh, high-grade dysplasias. So this net prediction is, is about 93%. So the patient walks into our clinic, so they will have two types of diagnosis. This is the predictive model we are presently working on. So the, the, the area is identified, you will get an imaging score as well as a uh, uh, cytology score. And this is how we are managing the potentially malignant disorders, just not diagnosis, but as well as surveillance. Yeah. So all this in the telemedicine module, all the patients still seen through a remote specialist and they go in for an, uh, for an other referral and for the management. So to summarize, this is how the ML, it does do a provisional diagnosis, dual mode, uh, it gives an imaging nearly completes to say about the dysplasia, risk profiling with, with the molecular cytology for high grade versus low grade. We have other do uh, research going on, uh, cell scope, uh, photodynamic therapy, optical coherence tomography. I'll discuss about it whenever I get an opportunity next. So these are all uh, prototype, well-published, to be positioned in a different level of healthcare system. This is where the grants and research comes, most of it from NIH. The major uh, collaborating institutes are uh, Memorial Sloan, Indian Institute of Science, UCI Irvine, University of Arizona, Karkinos Healthcare, and a few mentioned, uh, and recently we do have an ICMR grant. So this is where the task force lies, steered by Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, so I think I'm well within the limit. I'm more happy to take questions. I see one hand already up. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. And uh, I just asked, what will be the cost of this autofluorescence? <laughs> the the probe, uh, it's it's probably it's around thousand rupees. Okay, uh, so really it, 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 no, it is the, the criteria is to have it as a low cost. But uh, eventually, there will be some subscription charges which will which will come translate when when we do a scale up. So you know, but uh, it will be a very very low cost one. And that uh, uh, translation of the image, how do you do that? We is it by learning or uh, is there some module for it? Uh, Ma'am, I didn't get your question. What do you mean that by translation? Imaging of that uh, you get no in the scope. You get the image, and uh, how do you interpret oh, that? It's just a, it's just a click of a button. It's just how you capture a photo from your camera. Okay. So Thank identify you. the vision and capture it. Okay. Uh, Darker, sir, please, your comment. Sir, you are muted. Are you talking to me? I think it's an interesting observation, and I think it's a very good study, and I think that... Uh, there is no question that data probably is the biggest driver in any study on artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. They have the data that is coming in and I think it will probably be of incremental healthcare value. And in fact, it has a potential there. And uh, in fact, I think uh, what is going to be required for uh, detection of, we have a quarter million people checked up at the Indian Institute of Head and Neck Oncology across India that has been covered in a book called autobiography of a cancer center. And I think what is going to be required is the image, uh, data bank imaging, that eventually the digital imaging. I'm sure that the nuances of the uh, artificial intelligence, the protection of the privacy of the patient and the security will all be taken care of. I'm sure Dr. Praveen Birur would be able to answer how does he prevent privacy encroachment as well as protection of the data. Because th those are the sensitive issues when it comes to discussing artificial intelligence. Yeah. So, so, so let me come to the patient protection. It has the global standard. It is through National Institute of Health, NIH grant. The acceptance of this grant is about 2% in general for the general audience. It runs through Health Ministry Screening Committee of ICMR before any, any data is collected. It is HIPAA compliant. So entire data has is de-identified. Identified data is only for the person who, are, who collects the data, and it is in a very secure cloud server position in India. So there is there is absolutely no worries about the data breach or the protection. As well as you said, the large repositories, yes, we had recently have an, another bigger grant coming from ICMR, 
which we are certainly going into make it as an open source platform. Open source platform doesn't ensure that anybody can download the, the credibility of the organization has to apply for the scientific advisory board of, uh, of the framed organization. And with their permission, they are more than happy to use our data. So we need, we have about 60, 70,000 of just the images with autofluorescence and of course of cytology. So the whole idea is this is all not for profit to help anybody. So more than happy to share with the regular protocol and the ICMR. I hope I have answered your question, sir. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you, sir. There is one question from the audience. Dr. Aruna wants to know how frequently you have carried out the artificial intelligence what do you mean by frequency? It's for all the patients who walk in and uh, wherever the outreach, Nagaland, no, I think. Uh, for the public health, like rural areas. Yeah, 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 yeah. This has been taken to the field already. Yes. For how, how currently in one year, how many times you are done for that? So, so I'll say a small primary health care will cover uh, an active, very active primary health care will cover about uh, say about three, 350 cases in a week. So it depends on the uh, on the capacity and the competence of the healthcare worker to it. So it's you can look into our programs in Varanasi, um, uh, Assam, and uh, multiple places. Yeah. So it's not nothing to do with frequency. This is already translated. And uh, now ICMR, if you all are aware, it looks as TRLs, telemedicine readiness level. So this all conceptualized, proved, it is published in nature. So now it, we have to go ahead for the eight and nine, that is the approval of CDSO and uh, commercialization. That's where it stands for. So the dentists who participate in the training program have, do use these devices, but it's not at a very large scale that you just download the application and use it. We haven't reached that stage. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Vivekanand wants to do, you can unmute, sir, and you can speak. Dr. Regi, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Birud, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. I just have uh, some queries is how, what is the efficacy of your artificial intelligence in uh, not only capturing, but uh, giving a primary diagnosis uh, of the oral lesions? So that's what I showed. It is about 88% accuracy to differentiate into two buckets, potentially malignant and cancer in one, benign and normal. 88% accuracy. So, and what about? Sorry. Uh, yes, sir. So do remember this machine learning. Uh, you have to be very clear with what object you are looking for. At this rate, we have 88%. So please carry on with your question. Uh, sir, I'm sorry, but kindly try to understand when I say when human machines, human bodies are also not uh, absolutely efficient, we our efficiency changes according to our uh, mental balance or imbalance. So how would you look at the machine uh, fluctuancy according, especially when you talk of Northeast areas where the electric current or electric supply may not be reliable? Yeah, so that's where the machine learning helps. It is more consistent than humans. You don't have those errors. So that's where the machine becomes uh, more consistent. And uh, sir, I forgot the first part of your question. Uh, how do you, what do you, did you say about it? Uh, no, I, 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 uh, I, was, I was saying, like, depending, I'm also, besides an oral cancer oncologist, I'm also into uh, business management, healthcare management. So our effi efficiency of a workforce may depend on the mindset of that person on yeah, that day. Got it, got it, so sir. So, uh, same way, same way yeah. about the machines. Yeah, what so, about the changes in the power supply of the machines? And then their efficacy being getting affected. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Now, there is this is it runs on an offline. You don't need a power. It's a battery operated through, the, through your mobile phone. They need, they need to ensure that they're charged well. So the, there is no issue with the battery when they go into Northeast. I sincerely advise to look into a nature paper. So the accuracy of an onsite there in that study, especially which, uh, which we got into this, uh, the specialist has an accuracy of 92%. This has 88%. And then there is something called as NIQE, nature, natural image quality assessor, which we had applied through a MATLAB. It will tell the quality of the images which were used. 
So uh, when we arrived at an 88% of accuracy, there was some amount of image classification also, which was fed to the patient data. So now when they capture an image, if the image is not of that accurate because the person is not well, not feeling well to do and more- Excuse me, more, sir, we are running short of time. Can you cut it short? Yeah, so, so, it? The, so the machine is more consistent. Accuracy is about 88% and it does on an offline mode and it doesn't need any current. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So I think the uh, the algorithms once set, the machine will reach will read out, right? You're just setting up the algorithms. Yeah. So can we move on to the next presentation, please? Yes, sir. Thank so, you. So, thank you so much, uh, Pawan sir. I've been leaving. I have a few submissions. Kindly excuse me. More than happy to take questions, Shruti. Just let me know if somebody needs more. Thank clarity. you, Praveen. Thanks so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Now we have got uh, another uh, first for the scientific session by uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Yaugal. He is an eminent laser faculty. He is an internationally acclaimed clinician and a speaker. He is post PhD doctoral of laser photobiophotonics bio and uh, palliative pediatric uh, restorative dentistry. He is a gold medalist in MDS in pediatric dentistry and uh, topper in BDS, he has completed the diploma in orthodontics from the Orthodontic World Institute of Barcelona, Spain, served as a professor of pediatric dentistry at Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, director of head and uh, hand of India, the first department of laser dentistry and photo medicine research lab. Diplomate of International College at NM Ortho orthodontics and gnathology. He is a fellow of Asia Pacific Laser Institute, life member of European Medical Laser Association, vice president of College of Life Medicine, director of uh, Vault 2021 and 24. He has more than, uh, to his credit, 25, 75 publications in national and international journals. He has carried out the more than 100 lectures, symposiums, workshops on the laser, Pediatric Dentistry, Preventive and Restorative Dentistry in India, Singapore, Dubai, Spain, Taiwan, France, Germany. He is the founder of Laser Veda. I want to welcome Professor Yavgan, please. You are most welcome, sir. Over Thank you so Sarah. much. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you so much for the, that lovely introduction. That too, coming from an eminent ENT surgeon like you, makes it all the more special. My pleasure uh, and honor to sir, uh, welcome you all. Uh, can I start my screen share? Yes, sir. Yeah, 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 it's over to you fully. Can you please give the screen uh, share to Dr. Yamagal? Shruti, please. Shruti. I think so. she was off the screen. Yes, three. I'll just give you Dr. Yabagal. No, no problem, madam. Absolutely not a problem. It's heartening to see such a big audience on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Great. It's all because of the imminent faculties with us. Man. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. I believe it is because of the hard work put in by uh, Pawan Gupta, sir, and the entire team of I Can Care, as well as the support from, uh, uh, you know, eminent faculties like you. Dr. Pavan, are you, are, have you got the rights? I don't have the rights. I just uh, call Shruti. Shruti, usko, uh, host ko ye don't. the rights. Uh, host unko. Screen share rights, Shruti. I don't have the uh, right to give right to host rights. Ha, koi nahi. Me ko just host bana. Okay, I think you have the rights. Yes, I have. I guess my screen is visible yeah, now. Yes, yeah. Yeah, sir. Yeah, it's visible. Uh, at the very outset, uh, let me thank the entire uh, team of I Can Care for uh, having me here to speak about the blue diode fluorescence in oral cancer screening. Unfortunately, I've been given 15 minutes, so I'm really not uh, uh, sure as to what justice I'll be able to do in that sh short time frame. But yes, uh, a few uh, 
disclosures this is who i am and uh, uh oral oncology i've been speaking about this a lot to a lot of indian dentists about how photo medicine theranostics could be the next big thing for uh controlling cancer oral cancer in india now what exactly i mean by uh, theranostics is a combination of diagnostics and therapy which broadly uh, encompasses precision medicine targeted radionuclide therapy molecular imaging and together you know we have this triad of theranostics so uh, cutting the long story short it's a combination of diagnostics and therapy therapy part comes in the form of photo medicine diagnostic part heater 2 has been more manual in nature and uh, it's a sad story that we are all set to become the oral cancer capital of the world uh, let's understand the burden of this disease so that we actually understand what role blue diode fluorescence can play in uh, uh, catching this disease at an early stage in a country like india the burden of this disease can be understood by relating to a perspective on covid 19 deaths any any guesses how many covid 19 deaths we had in india in the year 2020 2020 was a peak year for us for covid 19 in india and um, according to the official report we lost 148738 patients to covid in 2020 why am i bringing up this i am bringing this up because let's look at the icmr report for the same year august 2020 have a look at the right hand side of your screen 135929 cases of the lip and the oral cavity cancer which one according to you is a pandemic ladies and gentlemen up to you to decide right so if you go by the same report if you categorize it gender wise in men it is now the number one killer right it's way ahead of lung way ahead of stomach way ahead of other cancers of the esophagus basically we are having one third of the oral cancer cases in the world and we account for almost 30% of all oral cancer cases globally we consistently lose close to 1 lakh of our countrymen every year to oral cancer right and it is supposed to worsen with uh, with time and in 6 years it's likely to rise by another 114% and it is not helped uh, by a uh, few of the endorsements that we see on television i'm not sure if you guys follow this guy cr7 and uh, we have our own uh, you know cheap good car sellers who come and spoil the party for us and mislead the youth of this country by calling this as the whole thing of bolo zuba kesri it is not bolo zuba kesri it is bolo zuba cancer if you allow me to put it that way now what's the problem with the current practices late detection extensive need for treatment high risk of recurrence loss of function high financial cost and a very low survival rate so this is where we are going wrong currently detection is a big big issue even after we detect something the diagnosis tends to be inaccurate in more than 60% of the cases and the surgeries that we, that are eventually needed to treat this uh, cancer of the oral cavity or the head and neck the recurrence rate is pretty pretty high and more than 50% of mortality rate it's been increasing for decades so we are here we need to catch them early if we want to watch them live it's as easy as uh that but unfortunately the traditional mouth mirror probe and the white light has not helped us i mean these are cliched uh, uh, you know ways of looking at an oral cavity and ulcer that is not healing a red and white patch in the mouth lumps or swellings i mean this is this is clearly not working and uh, like i keep telling in 10 years both the cameraman and the pilot lost their job so to all the young dentists there if you still think that you will be able to do a good diagnosis with a mouth mirror and a probe i'm i'm sorry it's time for us to upgrade it's time for us to screen every patient for oral cancer let me have let me show you an asymptomatic ill defined red and white lesion on the anterior floor of the mouth in a 15 57 year old male smoker this is what we see with a white light nothing actually we don't see anything at all but if we do a blue diode fluorescence scan of this we see a well demarcated dark brown to black area and uh, that's where the malignancy lies and it turns out to be a case of invasive squamous cell carcinoma so this is something which i want every uh, dental student to take note of laser or led based fluorescence screening is not a rocket science it is something that every dental surgeon can do in his or her 
operatory with a little bit of a training. You need to know some basics about how this whole concept works. For a lot of people, it's just taking any random light and just flashing it around the mouth and, you know, voila, you get the result. It is not like that. If you understand there is a focused laser beam or if you're using an LED, the spectral bandwidth is important. It's not the cost of the LED. It is the quality of the light, the wavelength of the light that is coming out of those LEDs. If the spectral bandwidth is not narrow enough, there will be no optical affinity between the photons of that beam and the chromophores or the fluorophores that are there in the particular area. They have to absorb this light and then give us the the, the effect in terms of fluorescence. How does that work? Well, fluorescence diagnosis and PDTA of skin diseases has been in practice for a long time now, but unfortunately, we dentists are a little slow in picking up things. We have just started realizing that oral cancer diagnosis can also be helped by a great deal if we incorporate fluorescence molecular imaging in our day-to-day -day practices. Let me demystify this for the beginners. I don't want to talk about laboratory-based stuff. I'm a clinician. I need something that works in my hand consistently, predictably, and it should give me results. And only then, you know, I'll be able to extrapolate what I read in a paper to what is happening actually in a clinical scenario. For me, for fluorescence to work, the chromophore is important because chromophore is equal to fluorophore. For those of you who understand the laser language, you know that chromophore is a photo acceptor. It has the ability to undergo a transformational change in the outermost electronic shell, provided it is hit by a wavelength of a specific range. Now, when it comes to the oral cavity, we are lucky because we have a fluorophore in the form of a flavin adenine dinucleotide. Why is this so important? What's this whole concept of autofluorescence? Flavin adenine dinucleotide in a healthy oral mucosa tends to be in an oxidized state. So when a blue light is incident upon FAD, if it is in an oxidized state, it will give us a healthy green output, healthy green glow. Unfortunately, if there is dysplasia creeping in, if there is a PMOD, which is you know more or less going towards uh, 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 the breach in terms of becoming malignant, the FAD will not be in an oxidized state. Those are the regions where the incident blue light will not emanate a healthy green glow because the FAD is not in an oxidized state. It is indicative of a deep dysplasia. So that's the basic concept behind optical biopsy because a lot of people are scared of going to a dentist or an oral surgeon for the fear that they might use a scalpel for a biopsy. Here we are moving towards optical biopsy. And this is basically based on a concept called Serenkov luminescence, wherein HV stands for a specific wavelength. An electron in the outermost shell of the fluorophore will absorb that specific photon of uh, wavelength and then will rise from a ground state to an excited state and it cannot stay in a photo excited state for a long time so it has to decay when i say it has to decay it has to come back to the ground state in doing so the excess energy that it had with it at the higher energy level will come out in the form of a specific wavelength as a healthy green glow or a healthy green output now, the important thing in this is that we need good filters to identify this output. So optical biopsy works when there is a proper light source. Let's say we are lock, looking at a normal oral mucosa. We use a 450 nanometer blue light. When a 450 nanometer blue light falls on a normal oral mucosa, what happens is that the fluorophores, the flavin adenine dinucleotide in a normal oral mucosa will be in an oxidized state. It will absorb that 450 nanometer of light and it will go, the outermost electrons will go to a higher energy cell with a photo excited state, stay there for a little while. And then on the, in the, on the path of PK, they emanate a wavelength of 515. Now, a lot of people will find this shocking the incident wavelength was lesser than the output wavelength. Is that so? Absolutely so. I'll, I'll tell you why. Please understand this. This is a normal oral mucosa. 450 gives us a healthy green glow because the FAD is in oxidized state. Now, this is the formula that a many of the so-called laser pundits also get it wrong. There is a concept that a higher wavelength will give higher power to the, to the photons. It is absolutely the reverse of that. Please understand that the energy carried by each photon is inversely proportionate to the wavelength. So a 450 nanometer wavelength photon will carry more energy than uh, you know its higher wavelength counterpart. It's inversely proportionate. 
that's the reason why when you throw a 450 nanometer light on a healthy oral mucosa which has an oxidized fkd it will throw out a wavelength which will be higher not lesser that's the reason why we get a healthy green glow so you can't simply pick up a cheap chinese light and then tell that you are practicing auto fluorescence it is not the spectral bandwidth the quality of the light that is emanated from that particular diode matters you cannot simply pick up anything that is convenient for you and then expect to catch a lesion early now what happens uh, when there is uh, you know when there is dysplasia let's say in this case there is severe dysplasia you throw a 450 nanometer blue light i think somebody's mic is on and some music also great so when you this is a little yeah sorry okay. sir we have uh, muted everyone thank you so much for that okay so when you throw a 450 nanometer light on a dysplastic tissue what happens when you throw a light on a dysplastic tissue the fad will not be in an oxidized state so it will not be able to emanate a healthy green glow it appears dark on the filter this is how this works and this is by far the the easiest way to detect potentially malignant disorders and that's has that has been tried globally and this is how auto fluorescence loss works like i said by using a mouth mirror and a probe and our bare eyes with white light we see nothing we are absolutely blind have a look at this picture everything looks normal here but the fluorescence scan shows that there is loss of fluorescence and the fad is not in an oxidized state and it turns out to be malignant so a healthy tissue is marked by healthy fluorescence and healthy tissue is marked by you know a darkish blackish halo that's another case a 34 year old male associated with a human papilloma virus infection so the light source that you use for fluorescence is absolutely important like i keep telling science and convenience cannot go hand in hand you can pick up anything that is convenient for you but it will not be scientific enough for sign being scientific enough we need to understand the optical affinity between the quality of the photons that are emanated from that particular light source and the fluorophore that is going to absorb these photons only then we are going to get this whole concept of fluorescence right i have been working with this device and it's an fda approved uh, who uh, recommended device i like this purely because of the quality of the photons that i get with the blue diode i am basically a hardcore laser guy this has to be accurate for me only then my second step of teranostics that is this is diagnosis the second step is therapy for me my therapy works with multi wavelength lasers provided my diagnosis is right if i go wrong in catching the disease early then i'll be wasting my 640 photons or my 810 photons on trying to reverse a lesion which may be malignant to begin with so usually what i do is i do this and like i said 450 nanometers is the blue light that is being used like i keep telling you the spectral bandwidth is very important you cannot pick up anything that is convenient that is blue you cannot use your curing gun you cannot throw any light on the tissue and then expect to see a green glow by looking at any optical glasses so there has to be a specificity and only then you will get a proper diagnosis of of loss of fluorescence depending on the border depending on the degree of darkness and if you want to follow it up you can as well do the the blanch test this is how this works uh, this is absolutely non invasive the device can aid the dentist or dental dentist in so the the other advantage of this is that we were using this device uh, during the covid times to pick up a lot of mucormycosis cases because it's not just a malignant uh, lesion that it picks up it it can pick up a fungal infection it which appears yellow a bacterial uh, load which appears as red so that's the reason why you need to be very specific about what kind of a pathology you are uh, using this light on there is a visible leukoplakia appears irregular appears dark and then you refer the patient for a biopsy it turns out to be severe dysplasia on other hand there is another similar case of visible leukoplakia but the fluorescence is normal and it turns out to be negative on a 
biopsy. So this is how it works. And this is an evidence-based uh, system where you can record each and every finding the, uh, on the software that is provided with the device that is attached and you can document it. So as per the American Cancer Society, early detection is very crucial and we could not agree more with it. We had a previous speaker who was talking about the AI powered uh, uh, diagnostics. We also use an AI powered DNA ploidy test but the whole idea is to intervene early, catch them early. And then even if surgery is needed, a fluorescence guided surgery is what will enable a surgeon to exactly identify where he has to place his cut. So he cannot be, I mean, he, he, he cannot be simply, uh, you know, surgically excising every tissue that comes in his way. So he needs some guidance, some guided surgery, wherein he knows exactly where there is a demarcation between a fluorescent normal fluorescent tissue and uh, an abnormal loss of fluorescence that is seen that will give him an idea as to where he needs to place his incision and where he needs to do his uh, surgical cut. Now, the second step is even more important when we have a doubt and the patient is not uh, you know, directly ready to go for a surgical cutting biopsy. We do what is known as a DNA ploidy test. The concept is very uh, simple. We have two sets of chromosomes, 23 each, 46. Any cancerous cell for it to become, uh, for it to manifest as a malignancy clinically, the, the actual change in the DNA material precedes the pathology almost two to three years before it becomes clinically evident. So when we can catch aneuploidy, basically it, it, it signifies that there is abnormal DNA content in the cells and they are walking slowly towards you know, malignancy. That is something which we can catch as early as two years, even before the lesion becomes evident in the oral cavity. Can we put a price tag on that? Two years, even before the lesion is visible. It's just based on the high-risk uh, patients who, who, who come to us for a screening. We just do a brush biopsy kind of a thing, which is non-invasive, absolutely painless, and it can detect abnormal DNA content almost two years before it becomes evident clinically, because like you saw in the previous animation, oral cancer starts you know, it takes this bottom-up approach. By the time it becomes visible as a non-healing ulcer, we have already lost the train. So this is something which can uh, help us to detect these uh, lesions early. We can do a routine uh, uh, a DNA ploidy test for all those high-risk patients who show a loss of fluorescence on the blue diode scan. Or we could use this up as a follow-up after the surgery so that we keep a keep a tight vigil that the lesion does not recur. You could, you could see that in the previous uh, uh, problem list that more than 40% of previously operated surgical cases also go towards a recurrence. A, because the surgeon was not guided during the surgery as to what part he has to cut and what part he has to leave behind. And B, because this is such an aggressive disease, it keeps coming back and we need some way to check it non-invasively so that we are with the patient in this fight against cancer. So you could repeat the DNA test in three months, six months and understand how this, uh, the how the, the, the cells are coping with it or how they are behaving. And this is a recent study which has proved this to be almost 93.5% accurate. The sensitivity values were close to 93.5% and this turns out to be a very, very cost effective and easy way to do a ploidy or assessment of abnormal DNA content in all those cells which show up as a dark patch on the fluorescent scan. So together, we are able to solve many problems. First, we are able to solve the problem of late detection. The patients need not be worried if they are, uh, you know, chronic pan gutka eaters or if they have exposure to human papillomavirus or if they simply have a risk of oral cancer in their uh, siblings or in the family, they can just walk in for a blue diode fluorescent scan. And if we have a doubt, we do a DNA ploidy. The problem of inaccurate diagnostics is addressed. The problem of high recurrence rate is, up, is, is addressed because we do a guided surgery followed by DNA ploidy at every uh, 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 timely interval so that the follow-up and the surveillance is kept under a tight visual. This is how we do a blue diode guided surgery. We mark it up. I have a video for this. We have been doing this in a small town called Hubli in Karnataka. I have been uh, blessed with to work with some really skilled oral surgeons. We do a guided excision of any kind of a cancerous tissue. I'll show you the video for that. And once we do this fluorescence guided surgery and once the excised mass is sent for a histopathological examination, once we confirm that, we follow this patient up with uh, advanced photomedicine and timely DNA ploidy tests are repeated so to ensure that there is no recurrence of the 
disease. So this is how Sorry, it is sir, done. Can this you is... please uh, the control in the time limit? Yes, madam, I'm done. Yeah. How to avoid second cancer surgery? We do it right the first time. Uh, good afternoon. Sir, sound the All cancer cells. Good afternoon, Dr. Murthy here. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Do I have time to complete the photomedicine part? I'm not sure. I yes, sir. Please go ahead. I mean, we'll please love to hear that. I please had some interruptions in between, so I was not very sure whether I should. No, no, please. So go what ahead. happens? Go what happens when you identify that a lesion is still in a stage of pre-malignancy? This sounds like mumbo jumbo, but no. But you can actually reverse it by using specific wavelengths of light. I prefer working with the 660 for oral lesions, sometimes with 810 when there is a lot of pain associated or a burning sensation that is associated. We have been doing this regularly for oral mucositis. We have patented a concept called combo coherence where a 660 red wavelength and a 9, 810 infrared fire together. Make no mistake, there are many dual wavelength options available, but we are interested in using a red and an infrared wavelength together. So this is how we are able to manage the side effects of cancer therapy. This is a recent paper, which was published in the annals of the Romanian Society for Cell Biology as to how effective this method is. And this is these are the guidelines from the multinational association for supportive care in cancer, which have now recognized laser photobiomodulation as a preventive a prophylactic modality to, to be used in every patient who runs a risk of developing mucositis post chemo or radiation. This is how we do the therapy intra orally, sometimes extra orally, depending on what exactly is the point. And uh, this is how we are able to create a three dimensional photons of light inside the oral cavity. And it is also effective in reducing the pain induced by toxicities related to head and neck cancers. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to cover that in detail, whether it is mucositis, dysphagia, oral dryness, or burning mouth, all these symptoms can be effectively treated by using specific wavelength PBM strategy. So this, I'll close with this last clinical case, 11 year old kid with nasopharyngeal carcinoma on radiation. You can see grade three mucositis. There is hardly a inch of uh, uh, tissue, which is spared. And uh, this is what we were able to achieve in a matter of three sessions of simple red light PBM therapy. And this was recently published as a novel method for the management of radiation induced oral mucositis. So this completes my triangle, Theranostics. It starts with a diagnosis with blue diode fluorescence, and then it starts and it ends by uh, being able to reverse or treat the side effects induced by cancer. That's who I am. This is what I could show you in the 15 minutes that I had. Any queries, you can feel free to write to me. I'll be more than glad to respond to you. Thank you very much, sir. You have gone really in a very short time, a marathon, and almost cover every topic in that, and giving us from the early diagnosis to the treatment and everything. I want the comments from our chairperson, Dr. Dhaka, sir, please. I yes, think uh, Dr. Dr. Yavagal is not a foreigner for us. He has helped us set up the photobiomodulation therapy unit in our department. And I think we are going to look at that very intensely in, uh, in September 10, when we will get the, the opportunity for all of us to be together. And I think uh, it's wonderful to listen to all this. And I think there's no doubt about it, that oral cancer has multiple problems, including second primary, it's field cancerization. The fact that survival is better but after every five years, there's an 8% number increases because of field cancerization. So all that uh, uh, puts into focus the need for such uh, technology so that we do not have patients getting lost because of the fact that they use tobacco in one form or the other. Because we have to remember that the tobacco users in any form puts the patient in the high-risk group for oral cancer. This was an excellent presentation. Uh, a lot of uh, teaching there. 
and uh, I, because of paucity of time, I am restraining my comments. So the right. thank you so much. Open, otherwise, we can move on to the third presentation. Doctor Yavagar, I look forward to seeing you once again. All it it will be my honor to to do that for you, sir. Any time. I want one question from the sure, madam, instrument. Can we do well intraoperative instead of frozen section? Asking for frozen, that laser will be Absolutely. helpful in getting Absolutely. the free margin. Yes, 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 yes. We are doing yes, that regularly, ma'am. Yes. That so video that I showed you. And time yes. limit will be all yes. restrained. Yes. No? yes, yes, absolutely. Very absolutely. That's uh, very absolutely. important. Yes, and and, and we don't stop at that, ma'am. After after the whole uh, uh, process is done, after the patient is rehabilitated, we call yeah. him for monthly follow-ups. Yeah. Where this is a non-invasive thing, it's just like flashing the blue light, and we pick up any loss of fluorescence and repeat a DNA ploidy whenever. We feel that there is a doubt of recurrence, so we don't wait for the patient to come back with swollen nodes ne next time. So okay. that's the whole thing. It's not just catching them early. It's yes. it's like even after the surgery is done, yes, we don't yes. want any kind of a, a, a recurrence, and that's why we keep doing this since it is non-invasive. There is no limit to how many times we can run that on a given patient. But I think so. Audience will also be happy, and there are a lot of questions regarding it. What will be the cost of it? What, because what everybody what I would suggest is. Uh, Dr. Yes. Rajkumari, what I would suggest is uh, I would request yes, this is the last to because stay, everyone is here. Yeah, we'll take the next session. Stay for the space to stay with for the panel. Yes, so I was going to request to, the same. Please uh, stay because he is going to be bombarded with questions. I think uh, yeah, uh, I request him to stay for the panel. So no let's complete the another scientific presentation and then we thank will. Thank you, sir. We'll thank definitely. You. Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Dr. Well, uh, it was fantastic. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now we'll have a third uh, topic, uh, the laser and photobiomodulation along with photodynamic therapy for the oral lesions. For this, we have got Mal Malika Seti, and I'd like uh, to welcome Dr. Malika Seti. Shruti, please, you can share the screen for introducing Yeah, the Dr. Malika uh, Sethi is currently as a director of Gums Polis Laser and Dental Care Center, Gurgram, Faculty Laser Dentistry University, and, and former professor and department of periodontist, ITS Center for Dental Studies and Research, Gaziabad. She is a fellow International College of Dentists, Mastership Diploma in Laser and School of Dentistry from the University of Vienna. Fellow of Academic of Oral Implantology, Fellow of Academic uh, International D Odontologia Integral, and Editorial Support Team General of Dental Speciality, uh, Specialities, and former course faculty of Comprehensive Implantology Program at ITS Center from Dental Studies and Research, Gaziabad, awarded the Chikitsa Seva Samman for the exemplary work for the COVID patients during COVID era and from the AMLA Jasi and Sri Ravi Sharma ji on the 12th June 2022. And she has won the Laser Dentistry of the Year Award, Dental Speaker of the Year in the Asia Pacific Dental Excellence Award and held in Mumbai and awarded Global Teaching Excellence Award in 2022. And with her teaching experience, she will enlighten us and guide us in the laser and photobiomodulation, photodynamic therapy for the oral lesion. Welcome, ma'am, Dr. Malaika Cities, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, Can I share my screen with your yeah. permission? Yeah, ma'am, please. Shruti, please. Uh, is my screen visible to all? Yes, it is. Yes, ma'am. Yes, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Warm greetings. 
I am Professor Dr. Malika Sethi Rishi. Well, I am a periodontist and a laser specialist. Well, it is a matter of great pride and proud privilege to be a part of the prestigious Oral Oncology Connect Education Series. I can care third international oral cancer e conclave. And at the very outset, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Reena Ma'am, for this wonderful opportunity and special invite. And I'm fortunate to share the platform with a galaxy of eminent speakers. Well, we all know laser is one of the most captivating technologies which has revolutionized several areas of treatment in the last few decades. And we are moving from steel age to laser age. And today I would be deliberating on the topic which is very, very close to my heart, laser and photobiomodulation and photodynamic therapy for oral lesions. Well, I just have 10 minutes for my presentation. So just quickly going through lasers for oral lesions. If I talk about the nomenclature of oral lesions, well, we have the normal variants, the white and red lesions, which include candidiasis, oral leukoplakia, squamous cell carcinoma, pigmented lesions like smokers, melanosis, melanocytic man macule amalgam, tattoo, et cetera. Erosive, ulcerative, and bullous lesions like herpes simplex, recurrent apnea stomatitis, erythema multiform, bullous pemphigoid, various tongue lesions, which we encounter normally in our day-to-day -day practice, miscellaneous lesions like mucosal, gingival overgrowth, and oval fibroma. Well, rightly said, India has the highest incidence of oval cancer in the world because of the widely prevalent practice of chewing tobacco and its derivatives, where it is estimated that about 40% of all cancers in India arise in the mouth, and it is said to be the most prevalent cancer among men, especially in India. Well, the tongue is the most common site for oral cancer, followed by buccal mucosa and the alveolus. Now, if I talk about laser for various soft tissue lesions. And if you look at this tissue specimen treated with laser, and if I'm comparing all the lasers, the erbium yag, as you can appreciate here, results in minimal coagulation when it is a hard tissue laser. The carbon dioxide results in severe carbonization. With the ND yag, we have a thick coagulation layer. Well, the diode is said to have the greatest coagulation. So precisely soft tissues are evaporated or incised, leaving different degrees of thermal denaturation, carbonization, and coagulation. Well, this is very, very important. So laser helps to cut, ablate, and reshape oral soft tissues with no bleeding whatsoever, no suturing is required. Well, there is minimal scarring and bone contraction allows for greater patient comfort and safety when we compare to other electrosurgical procedures. Where laser offers an excellent tool for removing various soft tissue lesions. And whenever we are planning to excise soft tissue lesion, it has to be sent to the lab for histopathological diagnosis. And it has to be made very clear that whether the lesion is excised with laser or a scalpel because biopsy with laser offers excellent hemostasis, a bloodless field, and faster healing. Well, you can appreciate here, ladies and gentlemen, all the oral mucosal lesions. So laser tissue interaction as far as action on the oral lesion is concerned is basically due to two factors operator independent factors and operator dependent factors. Now the operator dependent factors basically depend on the modality of use, the timing, which is very, very important, application timing, the choice of cutting distance from the lesion margin and the operator independent, independent factors, which include wavelength, which is again, very important factor and the optical property of the tissue. Rightly said, Increased cellularity and inflammation, which are typical of some lesions, can cause increase in peri-incisional damage, as stated by Romeo in 2014. Well, I'll walk you through various clinical cases which I have done. Well, this case is a simple case of uh, mucosil, a 940 nanometer soft tissue laser, diode laser is used here, 0.9 watt in pulse mode. Well, this is a case of mucosal of the lower lip. This is simple excision with laser, and this is six months post-operative. Well, the second case is a very important case as far as oral cancer is concerned. Oral submucous fibrosis, rightly known as a pre-malignant condition. Well, I happened to treat this elderly 
a person, a very, very cooperative patient, a chronic smoker, fibrous bands were present bilaterally on the buccal mucosa. Well, preoperative OPG is also very, very important whenever we are attempting a case of OSMF because uh, the condylar position has to be taken care of. And this OPG shows that the condylar, condyles were perfectly placed. So when the patient reported, the mouth opening was around 11 millimeters. I will not say the patient was not taking corticosteroids. Yet. Is everything yes. fine? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So the patient bilateral fibrous bands were excised and when the patient reported mouth opening was around 11 millimeters. The patient was taking injections of cortisone, a diode laser, I used a diode laser, 940 nanometers set at 1.5 watt and the bands were excised and there was considerable increase in the mouth opening. So 11 millimeters and presently I happened to visit well, this was a case I did during my consultation. So I got to know that the mouth opening has reached to around more than 25 millimeters. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, there are always chances of relapse whenever we are treating cases like oral submucous fibrosis. Now, talking about photobiomodulatory therapy, well, Dr. Yavakal has thrown light on photobiomodulation. But let me tell you, whenever you encounter lesions in the oral cavity, which are precancerous, you can treat it either with photobiomodulatory therapy or some lesions which can be excised with laser, as I have discussed in my previous slides. Now, what is photobiomodulation? Basically, previously known as low-level laser treatment or therapeutic lasers or class three medical devices, basically they have both effects, that is stimulating effect as well as bioinhibition. So they can increase and decrease the physiologic functions to reach normalization. So NNLP is all about emitting short wavelength, generally which lie between in the red or the infrared range. They have very low water absorption power and that they can reach only to a depth of 3 millimeters to 15 millimeters in both hard and soft tissue. Well, the performance power range from 50 to 500 milliwatt and the wavelength ranges from between 630 nanometers to 980 in pulsed or continuous mode. Well, I'll walk you through a few other cases. Well, this case is a case of herpes labialis. We all know it causes discomfort and extreme pain. So the most important part to remember here is LLLT, that is photobiomodulatory therapy, is generally given in the silent periods between attack. And it is generally two joules per centimeter square is applied near contact that is out of touch. Because if it is applied in the prodromal stage, the blister is likely to disappear in just two to three days, unlike the normal course, that is of eight to 14 days. Zoster and post hepatic neuralgia may also be treated. Well, again, a very important part is mucositis. Mostly, uh, we encounter in patients undergoing chemotherapy, and the incidence is around 20 to 40 percent of patients receiving chemotherapy. In 60 to 85 percent of patients receiving HSC, that is stem cell transplantation, and in almost 100 percent of cases with neck and head squamous cell carcinoma. So what does LLLT do or what does photobiomodulatory therapy do? So basically it acts at the cellular and the molecular level, unlike the normal excision of the, les of the lesion which we normally do with laser. So photobiomodulatory therapy, that is light, it activates cells, allows for proliferation and differentiation and in total we have a regenerative effect. Also, anti-inflammatory and analgesic effects are other factors. LLLT increases cellular activity, basically acts on the fibroblast, mast cells, keratinocytes, endothelial cells. So basically, proliferation of these cells take place. There is reduced prostaglandin E2, reduced TNF uh, alpha, and interleukin 1 beta. So basically, it has an anti-inflammatory effect. Well, the Multinational Association of Supportive Care in Cancer or International Society of Oral Oncology conducted a systematic review and first developed guidelines in 2004 
which were later updated in 2009 and 14 and suggested that photobiomodulatory treatment for the prevention and treatment of oral mucositis and head and neck cancer patients undergoing radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And wavelengths ranging between 600 to 1000 nanometer exert analgesic and anti-inflammatory effect. Well, 660 nanometer is more effective in accelerating wound healing and reducing the inflammatory response because it basically helps in stimulating the mitochondria. So mitochondrial activity is evident and also it modulates the cytokine release from macrophages. Now, very, very simple. We normally encounter aphthous ulcers, recurrent aphthous traumatitis in our day-to-day -day practice, basically found a non-keratinized mobile oral mucosa. So what does laser do? How does laser act? Basically, photobiomodulatory treatment can help in revitalization and pain relief. It increases respiratory metabolism, upregulates mitotic activity, and allows for collagen synthesis. But a simple case of aphthous ulcer treated with 940 nanometer diode laser 0.5 watt in a continuous fashion for 30 seconds out of touch. It is important to note that the fiber should be moved in a circular fashion from periphery to the center of the tissue. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a very interesting case of lichen planus, which I happened to treat. Uh, this lady reported from Oman to India. And uh, when I was working at ID Center for Dental Studies and Research, I happened to treat her. She was actually taking corticosteroids, but let me tell you, she left her corticosteroids just to see because she was very curious to see the effect of laser. Now, since she was there in India for just 14 days, so what I did uh, before that, the oral pathologist confirmed it as a diagnosis as a case of lichen planus. Trya were visible both on the buccal mucosa as well as on the gingiva. So since she was there for 14 days, I gave her 0.5 watt LLLT, that is the power was set to 0.5 watt in a continuous fashion, and each site was laced for 20 seconds. Normally, when we do photobiomodulatory treatment or LLLT for such lesions, uh, timing between 30 to 60 seconds is sufficient. So non-contact mode was used three sessions per week was given to the patient for 14 days. And she was very, very happy after the treatment. Well, I have a video also recorded. I don't know whether I'll be able to play this or not. Uh, is it audible? Is the video... Uh, it's not audible. I hope everything... Not audible. It's not audible. Yeah. It's not audible. So uh, basically, the patient was very, very happy with the treatment. Let me tell you, there are no side effects of uh, giving low-level laser treatment. So important points to remember as far as photobiomodulatory treatment for oral lesions is concerned. It is a non-invasive, non-pharmaceutical, and economical. The impact is through its non-eating effect. There are no true side effects reported whatsoever with low-level laser. The effect is most prominent in cells with reduction reduced redox potential and effect on healthy cells is less prominent. Well, prophylactic LLT can be given in cases of oral mucositis because it prevents oral mucositis in patients receiving chemotherapy or radiotherapy and therapeutic LLT, it reduces oral mucositis duration. Now, if I talk about various lasers, the diode and the NDR, they are useful for pigmented and vascular lesions. Non-pigmented lesions are more effectively removed by erbium or carbon dioxide. They have superficial penetration. Diodes, they are deeply penetrating. So any lesion on the tongue and the lip will be preferably treated with diode because it has a deeper penetration superficially penetrating lasers like the carbon dioxide and the erbium family. Well, contact mode is used in all applications except when we have open wound. So in short, photobiomodulatory treatment promotes tissue healing, reduces edema, inflammation, and pain. And rightly said, laser energy is more easily transmitted through mucosa and fat than through the muscle. Now, briefly about photodynamic therapy. Well, photodynamic treatment is known as, as stated by Gersoy in 2013, it is light-induced inactivation of cells, microorganisms, or molecules. Yes, ma well, I will not the go... time limit, huh? Please yeah. make it just, short. Just yeah. five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's okay. 
So we have two pathways, type one and type two. Type one, type two. Type two is the most common pathway. And in both, we have the reactive oxygen species and singlet oxygen, which are released and both cause oxidative damage or bacterial death. Well, they have a very short radius of action of about 0 0.02 micrometers. So high level energy laser irradiation is not used to activate the photoactive dye. Rightly said, LLLT has a high bactericidal effect as compared to HLLT, that is high level energy laser irradiation. So points to remember as far as PDT is concerned, it is a minimally invasive technique with least collateral damage. It is very, very safe. It does not damage adjacent normal tissue. No adverse effects such as ulcers, sloughing or charring, and photosensitizer alone can exhibit bactericidal action. So it exerts photobiomodulatory effect, which accelerates healing. Well, I would like to end my presentation with a systematic review by Pyrs et al. recently in 2020, where the combined therapy has been proven to be effective as well. That is photobiomodulatory treatment plus antimicrobial photodynamic therapy, which accelerated healing in cases of oral mucositis and reduced the time to lesion remission from almost 15 to 11 days. But I'm sure we are all are aware of uh, the safety devices because laser causes retinal damage and corneal damage. So one should have protective goggles. One should prevent inadvertent radiation, use high volume suction, and gauze dip in cell line should always be used to prevent heat buildup. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been my journey and I have deliberated at both national and international platform. I have deliberated on topics related to periodontology as well as laser treatment. Well, this was recently at Bangladesh where I conducted a workshop in March to April 2023. It was a five-day workshop. Other interna international symposium uh, where I lectured on laser in dentistry. Well, this is my venture in the heart of Guru Gram by the name of Gamso Polis. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patient hearing. And once again, I would like to thank the organizing team for their kind invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. So wonderful talk. Today we have seen all the diagnostic and even cutting tools to, from the benign to the cancerous lesion to the precancerous lesion. Wonderful journey. And you have shown us a complete spectrum of the disease from benign to the malignant. Thank you, sir. Over to sir, sir. Nikpal, sir, your comment, please. I think Dr. Malika has done an excellent job here. And uh, Dr. Rajkumari is doing the same thing at the Indian Institute of Head and Neck Oncology. And in fact, uh, photobiomodulation therapy is part of our early integration of supportive care, where right from the time the patient enters the doorstep, before the patient even starts treatment, he's assessed and evaluated and uh, treated based on the clinical findings. And uh, there are data to show that early integration of supportive care, as you correctly said, makes the patient undergo the entire treatment without interruptions. So there is a better survival if symptoms are managed right from the beginning. And that, I think, uh, happens in terms of oral cancer patients or radiation therapy, chemotherapy, concomitant chemo radiation therapy, targeted therapy, extirpative yes, oncologic sir. surgery. So I think uh, excellent presentation, running short of thank time, you. and I would like to thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for sharing the session. The presentation. And what I would suggest is if you can also stay back, we will, uh, I think. Yes, for the question. She's she's consented to stay back, sir. Yeah, so we can actually discuss all the questions during the panel discussion. There yeah, a lot, a lot of, of questions are there. Talks. Wonderful presentation, Malika. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Over to you, Shruti. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. And I would thank all our esteemed faculty for this uh, heart throbbing, excellent scientific session we have had today. I think me as a non medical could also understand what is happening. And what all things can be taken care into consideration for providing best oral care to our patients. Thank you so much once again. Let's move on. It's now time for the quiz competition. But before that, a gentle reminder to all the participants who are viewing us on different social media platform and on Zoom. that The uh, student paper presentation is open in the original research, clinical and review category for the theme oral cancer. Do it, but do it right. 
I would like to invite all our participants to put in their papers in all the three categories. The, uh, the submission date is till 20th of April, which is Thursday. And we're going to have the presentation on 22nd of April with the top five uh, papers, best papers in all the three categories. This is the link to submit the paper. We'll also put it down in the chat box for your easy reference. So uh, another invitation to all of, uh, to all the participants who would love to set down their paper and talk about the interesting research work they have done. We now move ahead to our quiz session. Uh, we have three quiz, uh, three days of um, uh, interesting quiz competition. The first day has already been completed last week on 9th of April with the theme oral lesion treated right. Today's day two of the quiz and the theme is oral prophylaxis and care in oncology patients. We have wonderful prizes for this coming up on your way. We are going to have all the participants who are taking the quiz competition shall have certificate from the organizing committee. Scholarship is being awarded to the winners. The first person gets a 50%, second gets a 40%, and third person, the third position gets 30% scholarship for the Certified Tobacco Cessation Specialist Program. The next set of 16 participants get 25% scholarship. There is opportunity for selection to 100% scholarship for the orientation course in tobacco cessation, again, accredited by Gujarat University. Every day, five lucky winners will get Triscare, mouth opening device from the team. These, uh, this is the certificate program which is run under Gujarat University by I can care. This is an advanced certification, the CTCS Certified Tobacco Cessation Specialist Program. Then next is the intermediate level certification, the OCTC program and the tobacco marshals program. So three certificate programs are run at the Akin Care Academy, build capacity, and we invite all our participants to take part in this competition to win wonderful scholarships and prizes uh, for, the, for the efforts. Now let us talk about the quiz. The selection process is as you can see, it will be conducted online for all the registered, uh, registered members. To win, you have to participate in all the three quizzes. There'll be 20, uh, 20 questions in terms of MCQs. Only one answer is correct. So the most uh, person who secures the highest score within the least amount of time will be chosen as the winner for all the three days. And then the decision of the judges would be binding um, and final. It, all the uh, answers to the questions would be published on the website, uh, econclave website, which is econclave.icancare.in and on the Icancare community page. All the winners will get prizes, which is given on the, uh, on the uh, which I have described already earlier. Okay. I would now like to invite and introduce to you the quiz master for the evening, Dr. Rashi Agrawal. I am the principal consultant on uh, clinical oncologist at Max Healthcare. She holds a PG degree in clinical radiation oncology from GSVM Medical College has an international fellowship by the UICC Switzerland. She's learned tomotherapy, IGRT, IMRT, image guided uh, brachytherapy, training in LBMMC Center, LA, USA. Has a training in delineation by European Society of Therapeutic Radiation Oncology School. Has a fellowship from Tata Memorial Hospital. I would now like to invite ma'am to take the session head for the quiz competition. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Shruti. Thank you so much. So uh, I have heard all the three uh, important discussions and you know they all were new for me also we basically treat cancer by surgery radiotherapy and chemotherapy but these topics were very important so i think we should start our quiz and uh, before starting our quiz we should uh, we are having some instructions please note that uh, there will be a link that will be shared in the chat box and uh, all participants need to open that given link please fill your name first and your mail and uh, so that your response can be recorded along with me it is very important and uh, please start answering the questions and uh, you will be given 10 minutes and there will be 20 questions and it is a mcq style so tick the right answer once you are done please submit your response and uh, as you all know the decision of quiz master and leader shall be final so Yes, you all should be muted and uh, uh, please uh, see your chat box not to prompt any answer and the answer have to be submitted within 10 minutes of completion of the quiz. So this is the quiz link, day two quiz link. So we are going to start. Please make sure you have written your name, mail, everything. Have you, just can we uh, can we have the quiz link on the chat box, please? Yeah, just just a minute, so that everyone can 
go to the chat box. So I'm just putting the link in the chat box. Yeah, sure, sir, sure. So, so here is the link in the chat box. Please go to the link. Start writing your name details there, and then we'll start the quiz questions. And uh, you can take the uh, get the link from the QR code as well. So is it done? Yeah, please tell us is it done? Is there any problem you can write in chat box? So can we start? Everyone is ready for the quiz? Write your name, mobile number. So these are must email, mobile, name, institute, city, and occupation. These are must. Just write it down and then we will start with the quiz. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, I think we should start. So good luck, everyone. So question number one is which of the following is not utilized? in photo biomodulation therapy a light tinting diode broadband light c is ionizing light sources d none of the above e is all of the above question 2 what is not the essential component of photo dynamic therapy what is not the essential component of photo dynamic therapy too much a is A is light, B oxygen, C photosensitizer, D carbon dioxide. So question number three. What is the most effective public health strategy in non-communicable disease control? Cancer. So option A is aggressive treatment, B is prevention. C is availability of cancer specialists in all hospitals. D is none of the above. Question four, which is not an indication of photodynamic therapy? A is tumors just under skin. Tumor on lining of internal organs. C is large tumors. D is none of them. so coming to question number 5 tris care the innovative mouth opening devices for christmas care is made up of a is stainless steel b is acrylic material c is titanium d is polyoxymethylene e is none of the above so question number 6 in a resource constrained settings for screening and early detection of oral cancer this can be useful and cost effective a is mobile devices b oral visual examination c scopes d training of all health professionals e none of the above so question 7 what is the most common complication of photo dynamic therapy a is nausea vomiting b is oral ulcer c is induced photo sensitivity d all of the above e none of the above so in the treatment of which diseases photo modulation therapy is used a is mucositis b is oral lichen planus c is oral leukoplakia D all of the above, E none of the above. Question nine: After radiation therapy, patients are advised to 
have frequent dental examination and use of water for relief of xerostomia b decrease sucrose intake and use fluoride supplement c use a fluoride supplement decrease sucrose intake and use water for relief of xerostomia d have frequent dental examination prophylactic treatment use a fluoride supplement decrease sucrose intake and use water for relief of xerostomia so question number 10 treatment of velloscope is used for so first is a is treatment of oral cancer b is prevention of oral lesions c is diagnosing oral lesions d none of the above so question number 11 which of the following is not associated with oral submucous fibrosis a malignant transformation potential of 10% b trismus c beetle nut chewing d blanching and shrunken uvula so question number 12 titanium implants placed before radiation therapy should be a left alone because they pose no contraindication to con uh, radiation therapy removed because they pose a threat to surrounding bone c removed because they increase the risk of infection in the bone d removed because they are a source of radio osteo radio necrosis so next question is question number 13 which bone is not part of the orbit sphenoid bone ethmoid bone lacrimal bone temporal bone question number 14 the concept of mrnd modified radical nerve section with preservation of certain structures based on the rationale that lymph nodes of the neck do not form part of adventitia of veins nor are located with muscular aponeurosis was chiefly caused by a suarez b boka c krile d sha so question number 15 save the youth campaign save is a suspension arrogas wallet in b suspect adhere volunteer end d c sensitize assist volunteer in force and d is strike act volunteer end question number 16 a 60 year old male patient presents with a white patch in his floor of mouth you make a provisional diagnosis of leukoplakia what is the significance of leukoplakia at this site increase risk of acanthosis b is increase risk of dysplasia c is marked hyperkeratosis d is increased lymphocytic infiltration question number 17 a simple method to clinically differentiate white patch such as leukoplakia and candidiasis is by velloscope b is biopsy c is scraping the lesion d is fungal culture e is none of the above question number 18 which of the following about tobacco and oral cancer are true a is dose response relationship b is synergistic action with alcohol c is associated with mutations in p53 gene d is all of the above question number 19 velloscope is not used for a detecting pre malignant lesions detecting malignant lesions detecting borders in surgical excision none of the above last question question number 20 is the only organization in india providing 360 degree care for tobacco cessation is ips ics i can care d is who e is fhnu
so this is compulsory case one would you practice oral screening and tobacco counseling in your routine after this workshop yes no or i want to start i can care tobacco wellness and oral screening center i want to get trained in tobacco intervention so tris care uh, the innovative mouth opening device for christmas care made up of uh, pom material which is unbreakable gives sturdy mouth opening can measure the grading and improvement of mouth opening you would like to order the same for your patient so please contact me i want to order or i want it available in my hospital pharmacy i will ask my patient to purchase it online from i can say care site or i will prefer the age old methodology so you can check your answer on uh, i can care page so this is the end of queues thank you for your participation thank you so much thank you thank so you much ma'am thank you so much ma'am i think all our participants are enjoying the quiz i have been maintaining the timer uh, with sir's permission and your permission uh, we would like to have the timer on for 2 minutes because it's just 8 minutes we have finished and then we'll stop the quiz uh, quiz link for the day okay sure in the meanwhile i am just giving the link to the facebook page and uh, i would request that please uh, all the participants and everyone who is here please join our facebook community page i'm just putting it down here so you you remain connected and we can discuss we have all the questions there the the link for this would be also uh, uh, shared in the facebook page so this is a link for the community page i can care community page please do join in here request everyone to join there please know that it is important and compulsory that you participate in all the three quizzes to win the prizes and the scholarship once again the prizes which come your way from this quiz competition includes certificate from the organizing committee to all the participants who are taking the quiz competition scholarship for the advanced certification certified tobacco cessation specialist accredited by gujarat university so the first three participants get a 50% 40% and a 30% scholarship each the next set of 16 participants get 25% scholarship there's an opportunity to be selected for 100% scholarship for the orientation course in tobacco cessation again accredited by gujarat university every day five lucky winners get truscare as an award uh, as a, uh, sorry truscare as one of the prizes uh, for the evening I think, I think with your permission, uh, Rashi, ma'am, we would like to close the quiz link. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. We now move ahead to the panel discussion, and I would like to invite Dr. Rajkumar to please uh, chair the session and take this ahead. Dr. Rajkumar, you are there with us? Yeah. Thank you, Shruti. After the quiz feast, now welcome back for our panel discussion. We have got a marathon of faculties who are ready for this panel discussion. Today's topic is of uncommon oral lesion, diagnosing in them in right, it right and treating them right. So help them to patient and the, improving their quality of life and the management. For this, we have got a moderator, our own founder, president, our motivator dr pavan gupta sir welcome sir i'm just giving a brief everyone knows dr pavan gupta but uh, just for an introduction i'm just giving a brief uh, review of uh, our president he is the director of max institute of cancer care he is the founder of innovative cancer care and rehabilitation member and executive committee telemedicine society of india senior vice chairman i can mean foundation uscc global cancer control community he is a member of national scientific committee addiction prevention rotary action group addiction prevention nominated in 2021 he is a member of ntpc cancer prevention and treatment advisory committee 
life member of millennial of india international chamber of commerce and Inter commerce industry and agriculture to his uh, feathers another in the crown is the author of well known books of the tobacco cessation program we know a tobacco is easy be smart do not start tobacco cessation a comprehensive guide to for all the doctors uh, who are doing the ctcs course and freedom from slavery making an institute tobacco free they are one of the important books on the tobacco cessation program which were written by our well known author dr pavan gupta sir he is a course convener and master trainer for the india's first gujarat university accredited tobacco cessation control program ctcs octs and tobacco marshal he has been awarded with the uh, icd international award in 2007 vivekanand um, sister margaret award 2017 and delhi ngo leadership award 2017 ai ecs award 2018 asia Af africa leadership and social innovation in 2019 and micc innovation award 2019 and rashtriya prabhasi odia prabhar award 2019 not to the end he is always an innovative person will be more credit to his crown i'll welcome sir for this uh, first of panel discussion and i'll invite uh, dr ms ganesh for the uh, panel chair as a chairperson for this panel discussion he is a well known surgical oncologist from videhi cancer center dr ganesh does his uh, mcs surgical oncology training from renowned cancer institute Adyar Chennai is also trained in surgical laparoscopy and advanced uh, cyto reproductive surgeries from Germany in the past Dr uh, Ganesh sir has uh, held the post of assistant professor at Cancer Institute Adyar Chennai and he is a senior consultant head of the department of surgical oncology at Dharamshila Cancer Center New Delhi senior consultant surgical oncologist at Fortis Hospital New Delhi and since 2007 he is heading the surgical oncology department at bangalore he practices in in the sub specialty division of head and neck breast cancers colorectal cancers musculoskeletal cancer at the institute and he has publications in various national and international journals run various clinical trial in collaboration with the research bodies of india and i welcome sir for this panel discussion Other thank panelists you, are, thank you, sir. Other panelists, I'll uh, ask to join for this. Dr. Malika Sethi, she is the director of uh, Gums Polis Laser and Dental Care Center, Gurgaon. Dr. Chandrasekhar Reddy, Vice Principal, Professor, Head of the Department, Dental College, Vijayawada. Mm -hmm. Dr. Aruna Dias, uh, he is a public health dentist and PGD in the. health promotion and he is also a certified tobacco cessation specialist attached with the i can care dr darshana varke medical director life scanner healthcare private limited welcome ma'am dr manoj tayal he is the director of radiation oncology at max super specialty hospital welcome sir dr hemant kumar nemade Consul, I think so. If I pronounce rightly, sorry, sir, if it is not, he is a consultant in head and neck oncology department of surgical oncology, and uh, and Hyderabad, Dr. Manish Goswami, deputy director and in charge surgical oncology, senior consultant head and neck surgical oncology, Medica Center Hospital at Siliguri, Professor Professor Chandrasekhar Yawgal, sir. which already you know all of him that he is a well known person for the laser and uh, welcome all of you for this panel discussion and over to you sir dr pavan gupta sir thank you dr rajkumari for that uh, wonderful uh, means introduction of all the panelists first thank before you, i start i would request my chairperson dr ganesh to say a few words after this uh, and we can start yeah. the discussion on that yeah uh, i think uh, dr pawan old colleague from delhi and then i think he has brought this institutions 
to such a big way and a long way. And today we have, I think, very interesting panel discussion on uncommon rural conditions. We all deal with common things, but I think that is where we fall to uncommon things. I think it should be very exciting to have uh, eminent panelists and uh, Dr. Pawan himself, a leading head and neck oncologist in the country to take the panel forward. So without wasting time, I think we should go forward. Dr. Pawan, to you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So my request to all the panelists, because we want to wind up by 5.50. So we'll be try to be crisp and uh, short. Uh, but before I start my panel, there have been some questions in the chat box for Dr. Yavagal and Dr. Malika because they had a, such a wonderful and a terrific presentation. I think people want to hear them as well. What is there? If there are certain questions, Dr. Rajkumar, if you think you would like to take up so which they can answer because they have been bombarded with questions. And I'm sure we will have these questions uh, also answered in our Facebook page. So request everyone to join the Facebook page as well. Yeah, Dr. Rajkumar, if there are certain, some questions which can be taken up by Dr. Yavagal and Dr. Sethi. Uh, Yavagal, sir, for this, uh, that you have shown us that device, what is the cost of it? Everyone is more interested in uh, knowing the cost of it. Um, I think Dr. Darshna can take that. She's a medical director. Uh, mm -hmm. If I am uh, right, it is around five and a half lakh rupees currently, if I'm not wrong, Dr. Darshna may give uh -huh. you the exact details. Okay. Yes, uh, Dr. Yavagal is right. It's around 5.5, uh, the cost of the device. Yeah, uh, isn't, isn't it something like uh, what uh, Dr. Praveen had shown? He said that it is just a thousand rupees that you can do a... It's a huge uh, difference. Sir, uh, this was just a camera. This mobile device. So uh, basically, uh, with Wellscope VX, it is manufactured by LED Aptarix from Vancouver, and it's an invention of British Columbia Cancer Research Agency, Canada. What is extremely important in tissue fluorescence devices is that the cellular excitation that it causes. Like uh, Dr. Yavagal rightly mentioned, that it, it is extremely important what wavelength of light and how much uh, the quality of which it generates the intensity of See, it. Uh, uh, let me just uh, put it, uh, let me as a uh, in, intervene here. See, they have been doing very extensively. They have been doing uh, in Northeast, in uh, in UP, and they've been using a very simple uh, device, which was costing only 1000 and that was attached to a camera. But he also- And this, uh, this particular device, which is costing almost 5.5 lakhs, Mm -hmm. And this one, I'm. Uh, this is a forum where we are all here in public. So Absolutely. just in a very short, crisp, uh, can someone uh, put it that he in India, which is a uh, means uh, you know the cost does matter in India for everything, right? So uh, so can we uh, take up this question with the Dr. Aruna, who is a community dentistry, and she's working a lot in the in the public. What would you say, Dr. Aruna, uh, if in uh, when we come to cost for this such interventions. Yes, what can be the simplest way of intervention that can be really taken into the public, into everywhere, you know, Northeast, East, West, North, South, everywhere in India, which can be really, uh, means cost effective and something that she has been working quite extensively maybe. And we'll ask Dr. Manish, who is also working Siliguri in the Northeast. Yeah. First to Aruna. So the uh, new uh, diagnostic techniques, uh, which are backed up by the artificial intelligence and the role of lasers and photomedicine and all these things are most welcome. But however, the, whenever it comes to the population level, so like uh, here, we, in order to have the globalized uh, international non-communicable disease surveillance system, so the basic stepwise approach uh, would be there, wherein like we'll take the uh, question is standard and method of collecting, analyzing, and disseminating the data on NCD risk factor. And where these uh, fact, uh, diagnostic tools or the or what is the role of this uh, latest uh, uh, techniques in the diagnosing the oral cancer, whether they're going to uh, play a diagnostic role or the prognostic role, so that we that we have to see, sir, most of the time, the oral yeah, and the clinical that's, that's important, examination yeah. because... Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Manish. So, whether it is going to be like uh, focused on the high risk factor or else in the approach or else are those on the mass level. So, that also matters, sir. As yeah, far as the Manish point. is working in the Siliguri, where yeah, uh, tobacco is a like everyday thing. Yeah. yeah. So, sir, I think uh, Northeast tobacco consumption is a little yeah. different. We are 
more of betel nut, betel nut with tobacco, which has a much more uh, dangerous effect on the oral cavity. Uh, I agree with your question, and what I would like to highlight is that it has to be a uh, spoke and wheel kind of a system. So if we, we have to have a device which can reach to the masses, which is probably cheaper, which helps us to screen more, and probably once we screen those patients, they come to a specific clinic or a specific center where we can have high-end device, which will be much more specific. So uh, looking at the volume of DGs and the volume of, uh, I think, the uh, recent ICMR uh, study, which has come out, that we are looking at a tsunami of cancer patients, not only head and neck overall. The number of special, uh, specialties uh, working in oncology are also becoming subspecialized. That is why the need for a spoke wheel system where uh, screening can happen on, on a mass basis, which is maybe a mobile device induced, and then ultimately to a center where that can, they can be segregated. Another thing which I wanted to uh, say is that whenever we are talking of screening, I, I saw probably there was a question in the quiz section, whether visual screening, it might be a... Uh, uh, mobile-based screening, but many things are visual. We have learned it over a period of time. Your eyes get trained over a period of time to identify lesions. So it has to be a vis visual as well as uh, technology-based screening. So anything which is cheap has to be there because in India, cost does matter. Thanks, Manish. So in India, cost does matter, but of course, there is a room for both the things. For the mass, see, there are two things that happens in India. One Absolutely, is sir. We, Absolutely. Are, we are going to the masses. The other group is that the mass or some patients are coming into our clinic, right? So when we are sitting in a big hospital, the patients come into our clinic when they are already diagnosed. Mm -hmm. But when we are going into the community, we are actually looking at people, lacks of people on, on whom we want to diagnose. And there we need to have some easy or what we we'll call screening methodology, which is cheaper and easily available. So I go to Dr. Hemant. Uh, Hemant, what is your take on this? I would like to add one thing here. Like actually yeah. here, the sensitivity and the specificity of the screening tool, whatever we use matters a lot. And here, like uh, we are just uh, detecting the diseases in the submerged portion of the iceberg through the screening actually here. So uh, one thing that I uh, really want to put here is what, you know, uh, means in India right now, what we are trying to do is we want to bring down the stage of the disease at which we are mm. actually able to pick up rather than picking up those diseases which will come after two years or three years. Right, That is something that is uh, where we are actually focusing. Chronic non-communicable diseases is the major risk factor. So where we have got the major window of opportunity to diagnose them at the earlier stage, sir, like here. So uh, Dr. Heman, your take? Uh, as you rightly pointed out, the uh, patients who are coming to a tertiary care cancer hospital, they are mainly advanced. And uh, to increase the overall survival or uh, to make real impact in pe uh, people's life, we need to uh, downstage the presentation of the pa uh, patients. And screening is uh, important. But uh, the more, uh, uh, more important thing is that it is a visible ulcer and they don't come to the, uh, they don't reach to the cancer hospital. So screening is a one part that they don't get diagnosed. And second thing is they, uh, they, uh, their reach to the hospital is also a gap. So both has to be worked together about the uh, cost of uh, screening and uh, about the uh, uh, devices. So till now, the scientific, uh, there is no evidence that visual imp visual uh, 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 visual examination or visual inspection those uh, uh, community level they have made an impact uh, 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 to a level uh, the new devices they add uh, to screening but they, their uh, cost effectiveness and uh, whether they really work in community that trials need to come up and because uh, the, some new device should not be like uh, what uh, what Dr. Berur said that negative uh, we should not uh, miss the cancer that is the main focus. But same way there is a uh, if we uh, get uh, false positive cases also so that impact that patients get anxious and all that that also has to be taken into account. So uh, low cost uh, doesn't mean that we should have less precision. So these uh, uh, devices still there is a way to go 
and to get that uh, uh, what you say uh, transfer the uh, uh, quality control and but uh, we are um, moving on it maybe we'll get to that that's what i i think see uh, that is important again uh, as uh, we need to have there is a room for both the things and more importantly we need to also look after the screening purpose is done after the screening we are getting huge number of lesions we are, uh, field cancellation is very common we get such type of lesions which are throughout the oral cavity so how do we go about it that is another area of concern how we have gone to the northeast and we will see invariably 40 to 50% of the patients whom we screen will have some or the other lesions now the second part is very important what uh, yavagal dr yavagal was always putting very uh, emphasizing on that it is just not the diagnosis we need to do the treatment as well to reach out to that level of treatment that is what is very important any take on that so how to reach for the treatment at that at the peripheral level because all the patients are not going to come to the max hospital or they are not going to go to the hyderabad uh, hospital or neither they will come to dr yavagal at his hospital so we will have to take the treatment at that point any take any easy way methodology that anyone can put it Dr. Yavagal, any, anything that you would like to say on that? Sir, there are two things. Uh, pardon me. I don't believe in this concept that uh, uh, India cannot afford this kind of a technology or I am sorry, but that's not how really? I have understood things. Because 18 years ago, when I started my exclusive laser center in a small town like where I am right now, it's not even visible to you probably. on If you open the India map, probably you'll not even find my place. It's a small place called Hubli. Probably Aruna Madam knows it. She's done her uh, master's from the same college where I was and UG. And uh, people had told me, including my professors, that you have gone out of your head. You are investing on something called as lasers in a small town. You are going to fail big time. Thanks to them, I have always had this the, the point of, uh, you know, uh, doing things which I felt was right. And I invested in this technology almost 17 years ago. And uh, the rest, okay, God has been kind. Uh, a, uh, for me, what that device does is not so important and what the entire philosophy entails is what I look at. So if we are do looking at any device for that matter, whether it is well scan or any other photo medicine device to reverse a particular lesion, for me, the quality of the photons matters the most. Uh, the dentists on this panel will agree. Uh, dentistry is moving towards a lot of these uh, adhesive procedures where we teach our students how to do these adhesive, uh, you know, composite based restorative procedures on teeth. Unfortunately, the least priority is given to the curing light. So our students today, if you ask them on the panel, which is the best restorative material in the country, they'll tell 3M, they'll tell GC, all those names. And then they'll blame the material if it fails. They'll never question, did I use the right photon, the light uh, that was used, was it a cheap Chinese light for 1000 rupees or was it uh, giving us the right quality of photons which would initiate a polymerization reaction which is so important for the composite to set. Just, just a very uh, simple analogy. The same way, it's not about whether I'm using a Korean 1000 rupee light or a Chinese 500 rupees light. What information it gives me, whether it is able to provide that photo excitation at the level of the cells depends on its spectral bandwidth. If majority yeah. of the practitioners today have, who have got a laser have no idea what wavelength it is. When we ask them what wavelength light you are using, they'll tell, sir, my 5 watt ka laser hai, my 10 watt ka laser hai. A lot of the people, Dr. Sethi will agree with me, we have worked on so many uh, 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 panels and courses together. When we talk about wavelength, they think that the same 10 watt or 15 watt, the W stands for the wavelength. That's a sad part of the story. So somewhere uh, I feel that uh, we we have to take that thing back ki hame sab cheap chahiye. Indians cannot afford this. That's a very uh, uh, I'm sorry, but that is a dated, no, no, that is a dated concept. So that is what I said, uh, Dr. Yavagal, that we have room for both the things. That is true, sir. True, where sir. we will need this. There is a room for uh, having the high-ended uh, things available. So I'll just show if one slide and I'll request Dr. Malika to say what to do on this, right? Yeah, sorry. So this is a 52-year-old patient, and he has got multicentric lesion on the tongue, on the buccal mucosa, that is a lycoplechia, and uh, 
that is an invasive cancer also. Just look at this patient. He's an industrialist. He's come from Sitapur. There is lesions here. There is lesion there. There is lesion everywhere. And then there is a lesion here which has been biopsied and which is showing it to be malignant, which is a... So now we have got surgeons. We have got radiation oncologists. We have got laser therapist. Everyone in the panel, we have got a mixed panel. And then we have got a very senior chairperson here. And uh, so let's what can we do about this patient because this is a very i think not an uncommon but a quite a common when you can when you can pick up i'm i'm sure we can pick up. so dr manisha what what would you do then i'll ask dr manoj Tayal, dr manisha your take uh, sir basically sorry, uh, Ma sorry malika, malika. Sorry, sorry dr malika dr malika yes sir yes sir sorry yeah no problem no problem Sir, uh, as we all know, leukoplakia is a pre-malignant uh, lesion which is non-scrapable. So uh, we can use laser. Yes, definitely. We can use laser and uh, we can just excise the lesion also and give uh, low-level laser treatment as far as pain is concerned. That is a photobiomodulatory therapy also can be given. Now, uh, with such cases of leukoplakia, well, there have been studies where recurrence or malignant transformation has been reported, but that has been only occasional. And uh, studies by Sheet all in the year 2004, where uh, the rate of recurrence was around 7.7% and uh, malignant transformation very, very less, like 2.6%. So if we have lesion on the gingiva, definitely laser vaporization is done. And uh, if we have lesion uh, specifically on the tongue or the buccal mucosa, then laser excision can be done. So I would repeat, if we have a lesion on the non-keratinized mucosa, like the buccal mucosa and the tongue, we can go in for laser excision. And for gingival cases, if we have leukoplakic uh, lesion on the gingiva, of course, we can just go in for laser excision. Of course, recurrence, yes, recurrence, uh, malignant transformation when we compare it with the scalpel with laser definitely that will be taken care of it is comparatively less and uh, obviously the post-operative discomfort pain scarring everything will be taken care of if we do a procedure if we treat leukoplakia or any other oral lesion which we normally encounter with laser so well there are advantages of laser over other procedures like when we use a scalpel so, for such lesion so, when we have uh, to excise my, uh, it so if for this particular case where he has got extensive lesion on the buccal mucosa, he has got a lesion on the tongue. Uh, just one before that, just let me ask you, do you take a biopsy before you plan for a laser excision or laser vaporization? Does that make any Yes, sir, bio Or just a biopsy. Well scope, if, the, if you have a well scope, will that also help just we, uh, do a well scope, uh, whether it is a... I think Dr. Chandrasekhar would be able to tell better about well scope. But yes, laser excision can be done for leukoplakic lesions. And of course, biopsy can also be taken and sent to uh, the lab for histopathological diagnosis. But for this... Uh, the lab person has to be told whether the lesion has whether the lesion is excised with laser or a scalpel because obviously biopsy with laser will offer excellent hemostasis and less post-operative discomfort as compared to a scalpel. Also, uh, one extensive... important point is the periincisional yes. damage, periincisional damage which we normally encounter, which can be encountered with laser because laser and uh, laser is said to have uh, thermal damage also. So that point also has to be considered. So uh, this thing has to be conveyed to the lab person, whether the uh, whether it is a scalpel uh, biopsy being done or the laser is being used. Right. So uh, uh, means with this type of a patient who has got multiple field cancerization, multiple lesions, what would be the site of biopsy? Do you take multiple biopsies from all the areas? Where do you take means the entire buccal mucosa, the the tongue, both the sides of the tongue. Where do you take? Where so do you mainly, uh, so mainly the lesion, uh, the, mainly the lesion per se, uh, maybe 0.5 centimeter uh, around the lesion also can be included whenever we take a biopsy. Anything, Dr. Manish? You must be seeing such cases extensively. You must be seeing yeah, such cases. So I believe he has got submucous fibrosis as well. The mouth opening is quite restricted that I can see. 
uh so if the patient is not having any lesion in the oral uh, buccal mucosa there is nothing to biopsy submucous micro uh, fibrosis is a critical diagnosis i will biopsy the tongue lesions uh, primarily because it is a tongue lesion the most dangerous site in the oral cavity i i believe sir you have told that one side it is leukoplakia the other side is uh, invasive carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma so that was an extensive so area obviously we'll it was a superficial yeah. but quite so, extensive superficial extensive yeah yeah so my take would be i will take the biopsy from the most uh, uh, extensive uh, ulcerative part if it is there on the invasive uh, carcinoma area and take a biopsy on the other side also but not i will if there are no lesions on the buccal mucosa in a submucous fibrosis patient i am not going to put my uh, scalpel there but uh, i will do the biopsy do the scans and then decide on this patient another thing which i will take into consideration is if somehow he has got field clearance cancerization this patient has got cancerization field cancerization he needs to be counseled to be on follow up he is not a very good follow candidate up, follow up is a must yeah. for all patients that's true yeah, yeah. what would be the treatment let's come to the treatment for this patient what uh, dr hemant what type of treatment you would like to give in for this patient uh, you will offer to this patient rather yes uh, the patient has a uh, uh, field cancerization there is extensive leukoplakia and then uh, one biopsy is showing one side there is a invasive squamous carcinoma so it requires surgery for that side uh, so there is no argument about uh, uh, the biopsy prone uh, uh, lesion now the uh, uh, question comes about what is the area which is not biopsy prone so when we see the most thick part or where we feel that there is a red patches or uh, something uh, suspicious area we can take biopsy and if it comes and uh, prosen if it comes positive we can uh, we can treat uh, the cancer at same setting if the biopsy is not positive and uh, clinically also i feel that it is not uh, looking like a malignancy on the op opposite lesion the uh, biopsy prone region will be excised as a cancer there is no doubt the other region we can do excision biopsy and save it for uh, histopathology and get the uh, diagnosis if it is a verrucous kind of leukoplakia we may miss uh, due to uh, during biopsy so that is one thing second thing the laser excision uh, we we do commonly laser excision for leukoplakia but in this particular patient the lesion is uh, going behind uh, in the posterior part of the tongue mouth opening is uh, reduced and uh, we use uh, co2 laser uh, luminous though that uh, whatever technology we have the mirrors we have we have the uh, handles but still to get that posterior margin is a, a difficult thing so uh, many a times anterior part we can deal with laser but sometimes we may have to go for the traditional cautery and uh, excision even uh, uh, because of the constraints of mouth opening and all those things for buccal mucosa those lesion doesn't look like uh, frankly malignant we may take biopsy or we may just uh, uh, do pulgration but uh, anyway uh, if there is any uh, doubt better to take biopsy before doing pulgration so that is how i uh, i go with it pulgration before biopsy before pulgration but uh, if you look at the excision the amount of excision see it had he had a almost like 4 or 5 cm of the lesion but the depth of invasion was just i think just uh, less than 2 mm that was one on the biopsy i had taken a incisional biopsy so the depth was only 2 mm so uh, and we know that with this extensive lesion if we do go for a surgical excision as you have said the patient will have lot of morbidity and then the tongue we have to do bilateral uh, see clinically patient did not have neck neck nodes and uh, it was a very limited disease but the depth of invasion was although superficial but depth of invasion was low so uh, how do we take care of this morbidity that is one thing is a radiotherapy an answer to that dr manoj uh good evening everyone so such an extensive lesion and uh, you know oral leukoplakia and patient having invasive cancer radiation may not radiation be the answer fibrosis with limited mouth opening yeah radiation may not be the answer for a patient like this so it should be you know surgical laser and other therapies like you know beta carotenoids and antioxidants and uh, you know tobacco cessation so these things we should look for rather than looking for uh, you know radiotherapy as an answer to these things so, so now we are in so the radiotherapy doctor hum log soche ki we will push to radiotherapy he will do something is not ready the surgeon the patient is not ready to go to the surgeon because it is going to be very extensive chemotherapy i don't think is an answer so again it goes 
what is the fate of this patient this is something very important how do we and this is not a uncommon situation right so, so, can I? so yeah of course yeah so, so this patient has uh, you know uh, such an extensive involvement and uh, these things are not common in our country you know patient come with all the stages of uh, pre malignant lesions and they come with the you know they will they come uh, to us with the full spectrum and uh, taking care of these patients uh, is a tough task although it may not be impossible in a scenario like ours like uh, you know uh, tobacco cessation is very important in these patients so the moment they are asked to make to uh, you know quit tobacco and they uh, you know stop uh, taking tobacco maybe in next 2 3 weeks with antioxidants they do show response so this invasive cancer also is a you know has been there uh, it is not a process of today so it has been developing from a long time so we we need to be uh, you know quite comprehensive in addressing these issues yeah so uh, actually uh, uh, so, excuse me sir sir i don't yeah. think uh, total glossectomy would be a choice but i agree with dr uh, heman sir that surgery is must for the side which is a proven cancer we have to address the neck without any doubt that is not a matter of choice it's it's so, a protocol we need to follow yeah, on so the there, other side there is lot of questions uh, remain yeah lot of questions about the neck dissection if it is just 1 mm or 1 1 point less than 2 mm depth and the chance again there will be lot of uh, controversies and lot of yes, things sir, if 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 we are planning to reconstruct that part uh, if it is more than 5 mm yes 4 mm yeah if if we are planning to reconstruct that part you will in, invariably open up the neck and doing one a one b probably for a free radial artery so that is the thing so for the tongue yeah, lesion uh, so it is going to be extensive a very very yeah. extensive so so now it is going to be really an extensive thing so this is what i did uh, a patient was advised surgery total glossectomy it was quite extensive patient refused patient was ready to run away so i suggested for a photodynamic therapy and my boss is here my uh, dr shomesh who has taught me photodynamic therapy during my mch he is also here so i did a photodynamic therapy as an alternate and, and I, i told him look the lesion is very superficial the depth is very low and although it extensive if we can do a photodynamic therapy invariably if it fails you are going to end up with a glossectomy if it works it's your chance so he agreed to that and uh, then this is what we did we did a photodynamic therapy for this patient and uh, and this is what is now after 1.5 years this is what has happened to this patient can i have a comment sir yeah just let let us just just let Sorry. us have one this video just look at this it's a very short video i'm just rushing through because of the shortage of time right so look has is he is able to talk so this is recently in 22 he has come again for the and he is absolutely doing well he is a businessman and we could save his tongue we could save his neck so it's of course it is open for criticism but yes this is the stage now it is almost 4 years now that his patient is doing well some comment was someone was 
Okay, sorry, sir. Uh, you got excellent results, and uh, 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 that clinical examination, uh, that uh, very thin region, what you said, may uh, may have uh, this thing. But uh, one another option was uh, which I uh, uh, I could have uh, offered is uh, the uh, wide local excision and uh, stage uh, stage excision for the uh, what you said that uh, morbidity could have been uh, uh, reduced by stage excision. That that one option was there. So this is one case. Any comments, Dr. Yavagal? It looks quite very nice good. result, sir. Um, I guess you have used uh, timoporphin, correct? Foscan, yeah. Yes. Foscan. And you have you have injected the injected. dye into the lesion, yeah. and yes. you must not, have not used into this. the lesion. We have given it IV, so okay. entire body gets photosensitized, and then it is so retained. So you you irradiate the laser after four days, if I'm not wrong. Correct. Seventy two hours. Okay. Okay, and you must have used a 650 nanometer laser for this. Correct, diode laser. Okay. Sir, what was the power intensity of this laser? Was it somewhere in the range of 200 to 300 milliwatt? Sir, again, I would be say I'm uneducated in that area, as you had pointed no, out. Sir. <laughs> no, sir, uh, that was not so, the thing. See, what happens is a lot of... Put it this way. Yeah, because there was this person, the, the technician who had come, he helped me out and I was, uh, we did this. And this is my actually fourth case. And after that, we have uh, the Foscan has not been available in India. And uh, after that, I have not been able to do. And I know that there are many patients who can benefit with this uh, photodynamic therapy. Dr. Shomesh is here in, in the, in the, as a, uh, and uh, he, during my uh, MCH training, there was the largest tra uh, trial that was being run. And he was there. So I was helping him. So I learned from there. Right. So, Amazing, so this is one, then I'll just quickly go to one or two, a few more, and then we'll stop because as such, that cannot be. Just look at this. Again, it is very superficial. Biopsy is again, uh, mild dysplasia. What to do? Should we go for a complete excision with the ref flap with upper and lower alveolectomy with neck dissection? What is the take, Dr. Manish? Sir, uh, not uh, not alveolectomy for a dysplastic lesion, removing the alveolus would make sense. I think for mild dysplasia, the uh, uh, Common would be a wide local excision, but I, if if the patient agrees to that, if the patient is nearby, is ready to come on a follow up, probably I will follow up the patient for one month on antioxidants and see how he responds to this. And uh, I will get the slides reviewed with my onco backwards to be absolutely sure, sure that because when it comes to dysplasia, it's a very subjective uh, take. Yes. Somebody, somebody might call it mild, somebody might, might call it. Uh, moderate somebody might call it uh, high grade. Moderate dysplasia right now probably has been scraped off as per latest CA. So mild and severe is what they reported. Aruna, you picking up such cases in your community? Right, then whom do you will send to the radiation, to the surgical, to Dr. Yavagal, Dr. Malika? First to the histopathology, sir. <laughs> but histopathology will only see the slide. He will not take the biopsy. He or she will not take the biopsy. So, so the most we'll important send, is to take we'll the biopsy. We will send it for biopsy, biopsy, sir, like any of the things. Like... Well, any comments from others? Anything? Then we'll move on. If, uh, uh, if the biopsy is proven, then the definitely dysplasia. Mild dysplasia. That is the that is so, the problem. Now, if they had not given any dysplasia, no dysplasia, it would have been different. They give mild dysplasia. Now it, that is the problem. What Dr. Manish has actually said. It can be mild dysplasia. Can be uh, wrong diagnosis by one of the pathology. It may be no dysplasia. It can be containing actually a lot of fungal infection. Maybe there, which can be also showing that with this reactive changes, there can be dysplasia. Uh, then, sir, it is a RMT lesion. It is a difficult area to excise also. So, uh, maybe we can remove the teeth and keep him under observation. If the teeth white is there, we, uh, that can uh, subside. Conservative therapy. I'll just skip. So, this. I think uh, giving a trial of, uh, you know, uh, conservative treatment to this with the close observation, you know, I think that should yeah. be 
the option for him. Yes, yes, yes. So this is another patient. Just look at this patient. This patient was being treated by some surgeon. Uh, February 21, April 21. Then when he came to me, this was the status. With extensive lesion, you can see. Extensive lesion here. The teeth, there's so much of dirty teeth. Everything is there. Now, Dr. Aruna, whom will you send this patient? And what do you think? Sir, definitely, sir, again to the oral medicine department we'll be referring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From there, like, uh, they'll take it a decision whether to go for oh. a... First Since it is a high-risk patient, like an already tobacco user. Mm -hmm. So can I say something? Yeah. Sir, uh, all the sharp cuts, sir, those have to be ground, sir. Because they come in contact with the... Uh, uh, Durga, your voice is not clear. So, uh, so, all the sharp cuts from the teeth, they have to be ground because they come in contact with the... So, the teeth, actually you will see that the teeth have also started you know, over sharp, a yeah, and the it teeth has the... become sharp and uh, yeah, all those tobacco so users will have... have to be he was a beauty user, tobacco user, everything, you know, mixture. Physical irritation is also there because it, of the like... The uh, teeth. Be but, what about the problems. other lesions? What about the other lesions? Yeah, anyone? Dr. Yawagal, anything that your well scope will help? Definitely, sir. I would I would use the well scope first and then do a DNA ploidy uh, to understand the degree of uh, aneuploidy, the degree of the abnormal uh, DNA content in the area. And if it turns out to be somewhere in the mild dysplasia category again, I would use multiple wavelengths and then try to reverse the lesion in a non-invasive way. I'm somehow not a very big fan of uh, the conservative antioxidant uh, theory and you know applying uh, steroid creams. We have excellent photobiomodulatory devices these days, especially in the red wavelength, which can reverse these kind of lesions. And uh, you can actually quantify it. Now, if you do a DNA ploidy and then you understand the exact level of how uh, the cells are at a given point of time, you could advise this patient to come for six or eight weeks of PBM, two or three sessions every week with multiple wavelength. We have sometimes use the red, that is a 640 to 660, or sometimes the 810. What we are doing now is we are using two together, which we call it as combo coherence. We use that, and then after six or eight weeks, you can always redo uh, your uh, fluorescent scan and every three months repeat the DNA ploidy. If you think that the case is getting worse, you can always uh, go for a more invasive surgical option. If it is improving, you can actually have a quantification of how much it has improved. What was the, the ploidy report before you started the PBM intervention and what was the status three months later? So we have an objective uh, assessment of how, whether it is improving or not improving and then we yeah. can take it further from there. I assume that there was no lymph node in uh, involvement no, and all the other things no. were, yes, right. No, no, no. right. Malika, your I just, Yeah, I just wanted to add on. I totally agree with Dr. Yavagal's comment. First of all, uh, cessation of smoking is mandatory. Secondly, maintenance of good oral hygiene as I can see like uh, the teeth are almost covered, like all uh, so many uh, stains are there. So oral hygiene has to be uh, oral hygiene has to be reinforced. Uh, thirdly, coronoplasty should be done as somebody as somebody mentioned, like uh, because it is causing irritation to uh, the lesion. And uh, definitely, photobiomodulatory therapy. The patient will be benefited. Multiple treatments, definitely, multiple treatments are required for such cases. The lesion will not go in one treatment. Definitely, the patient has to be followed. And I, I totally agree. Photobiomodulatory treatment is a good modality for such cases. And later, like one can obviously follow up the patient for long. So Aruna has uh, like sent this patient to dental department and she doesn't believe in sending to any of us oncologists what about our oncologist dr heman dr manish anything that you have to suggest 
I just uh, while screening, I would be more concerned about the lesion on the pellet, the erythral leukoplakia. It yeah. seems the pellet lesion that that is something that I would like to keep an eye on. He is not a surgical candidate yeah. as such, so patient stays yeah. on the follow up. So we go suggestion. Suggestion is important, obviously. I think that is absolutely wonderfully highlighted that many a times uh, surgeons do not speak on that. Uh, we uh, did a study in uh, our part of in, uh, the state. Uh, we looked into the time lag which is uh, which is taken for a cancer patient to reach an oncologist. That is around That's four months. Way. So the two months is diagnostic <laughs> delay because the <laughs> treating doctor probably is unable to find out exactly what is the issue going on. And two months is the patient delay because the patient is confused whom doc which who is the doctor he is supposed to come uh, meet. So that is the thing. So the I think uh, ignorance on the part of the doctor. I think as you have highlighted on your slide, that is something which happens uh, more frequently than we speak of. Yeah, that's it, Doctor Hemant. You are you want to add something? Uh, no, as uh, well, only one thing is that whenever there is a suspicious lesion in any course of follow up, it should be biopsy. There is uh, yes. there is absolutely no alternative to biopsy. And if biopsy is positive, then the uh, treatment is, should be initiated. Dr. The uh, surgeon should be aware what to see and uh, he should be aware that uh, what are the changes happening. Yeah. Whoever is following, uh, Dr. Manoj. Dr. Manoj, your take? Yeah, so this patient, you know, he has got very poor oral, oral hygiene, chronic tobacco chewer, you know, and uh, the lesion has been there. Uh, you have seen the serial, uh, uh, for, you know, photographs of this patient and they have just, they have just been progressing and nobody advised him to stop, uh, you know, using tobacco. So that is one of the factors which is very important in any case like this. <coughs> Over a period of uh, you know years, these patients keep on uh, you know developing these lesions, and nobody tells them about tobacco cessation. So I think it is uh, we we should be very serious about uh, you know the harms of tobacco, and uh, we should be very uh, uh, you know uh, vigilant on uh, these patients, and and uh, proactively we should uh, ask them to stop smoking. Yeah, and uh, stop using tobacco, it can be in any form, yeah. So, what I did was, basically, I give him sub, sub, uh, most important look at this, the mouth opening exercises, that is the risk care, and look at this patient within 15 days. How much is it open? How much is it open? 30. Now, 40 is open. Okay. Is it open? Let's open it. Let's open it. Let's open it. Let's open Just look at how many days you have closed the tobacco? 15 days. Just 15 days of stopping tobacco. Right? Almost all the lesion has disappeared. Just one intervention that was important was tobacco cessation. So such grotesque looking lesions in the oral cavity. The first step might be just stop tobacco. Wait for some time before you actually jump into maybe even doing a biopsy. I have not done a biopsy yet, right? And this patient has been uh, on follow-up. He came regularly to me every week and we did a follow-up. We just did a tobacco cessation for him. So this is very important that we need to learn. And then the mouth opening exercise, that was important. So this is just, I think I'll just take uh, with the permission of the chair, just two or three slides more and then I'll stop. But it's already 5.30. So, uh, this is another important area that we are mostly seeing. A lot of these patients, they have trisma. A very common thing. And uh, in your presentation, Dr. Uh, Malika has also pointed it out. Dr. Yavagal has also pointed it out. is a major problem that we see, whether it is in Guwahati, where the Goa is uh, used so frequently in the Northeast, everywhere in India because of rampant use of pan masalas and all. So, how do we manage this? That is another very important aspect. Uh, Dr. Malika said uh, in a presentation, she will do a laser oxygen, just a laser fiber. Uh, uh, Dr. Malika, with that laser, when you remove that fiber, yes, do, you add, do you put something or just what do you do after that? So basically, sir, laser is always used as an adjunct. I would like to point out here, laser is used as an adjunct to various like since I'm a periodontist, I would say to various non-surgical or surgical periodontal treatment. And also, uh, 
I will just come to your question before that uh, a case of PDT which was discussed. So if we have cases which are uh, which fall in the early lesion, standalone treatment can be a choice of treatment. But for advanced lesions, always PDT or lasers should always be used as an adjunctive treatment. So uh, my case, yes, I did laser excision, but uh, the patient was also taking hydrocortisone injection. That, uh, that was also important. I did excision of the bands present, which were present bilaterally on the buccal mucosa. But once again, I would like to stress here, we had to tell the patient that you have to stop smoking because he was a chronic smoker. So cessation of habit was my prime focus. Uh, later, after surgical excision, after laser excision, physiotherapy, which is very, very important for OSMF cases, had also to be uh, instructed to the patient because if the patient, because relapse is there after treating OSMF cases, either with laser or scalpel. So physiotherapy, as you mentioned, uh, like where his mouth props are available, should be advised to the patient because that, is, that forms an integral part of your uh, treatment also. So these things have to be taken into account. And we have stopped the smokeless tobacco two years back, actually. So the restricted mouth opening is mainly attributed to the betel nut, actually, in the pan masala, the smokeless tobacco. Smokeless tobacco, so that is... So the important aspect is that there has to be a mechanical mouth opener. See, the two very important factors in our smokeless, whatever treatment you are giving, whether you're doing surgery, whether this is two very important in all our oncology, head and neck cancers. One is tobacco cessation. That is the must. Number two is the mouth opening exercises. That is very important, right? Of course, the other part of this, whatever is required for the treatment, whether it's a leukoplakia, erythroplakia, whether it's a uh, dysplasia, that will actually differ from. But these two things have to be definitely, definitely given to all the, offered to all the patients. And this is what I am giving one example and then I will stop for, uh, just you will see, this is, this is one of the patients. And uh, he had come with a lot of Christmas, only two centimeter mouth opening. Now it is 1.5 centimeter mouth opening, just with the exerciser. Right. So this is the Triscare device. And uh, if you will see, this is how it is being used. And these are the village women where we have picked up on. Uh, screening in the village community work and they have been having this uh, toothpaste you know dentigerous toothpaste mm -hmm. and right, like right? patients so so this mouth opening room. device which has got a measuring mouth opener also so these are the must for all of our patients so with this i think i'll stop my because otherwise it will go on and on and there is no limit to that so I think I'll stop now. We had a wonderful discussions. We had uh, absolutely great presentations. So I hand over to uh, my chairperson, Dr. Ganesh, who has been my senior colleague and uh, at Delhi. Now he's heading uh, with the hospital. So over to you, Dr. Ganesh. Thank you, Dr. Prabhat. I think uh, it was excellent discussion on very interesting things and very common things also, I would say. I'll summarize like this. Uh, from whatever I could uh, gather from all the discussions which happened today. All mild dysplastic lesions, extensive lesions as we see, probably tobacco cessation, mouth opening exercise and waiting. Probably that seems to be the consensus among all the panelists. And I would also really appreciate what Dr. Yavagal was telling about photobiomodulatory therapy. Uh, I would accept that most oncologists or most surgeons would not actually venture there because they have not been using it. I would say that way. So maybe we don't know the uh, sort of the utility of it in a much bigger way. But from our experience, the other thing also works. If you wait and don't miss, nothing uh, greatly wrong happens. But I think photobiomodulated therapy is something which we all need to take cognizance of. For extensive lesions, I think Dr. Pawan made it very clear that photodynamic therapy is a very important adjunct. It can come handy and it will avoid unnecessary morbidity. Total blastectomy, I would have 
thought would have been really too much. Uh, I don't think anybody would accept it. And the results would have been bad even after total glossectomy in the patient. I think PDT was the right approach. So we have one more axillary like that, which can come very handy for patients. So uh, summarizing like this, I think we should look at a combination of treatments for these unusual situations. And they are very common. As uh, you said, they are very, very common. Uh, we don't face it one uh, very rarely. We do keep seeing it. So I think this panel discussion was very useful in that uh, sense. These are my comments. Sir. Um, I think it was wonderful. Thank you so much, sir. And I think uh, uh, I hand over to the organizer. I'm one of them. So I hand it over to Shruti <laughs> and, and uh, Rajkumari, Dr. Rajkumari and Dr. Rina. And uh, thank you for all the panelists. And I think uh, your inputs are well recorded. And uh, what I am looking forward after today's discussion is that we need to be trained also in this laser. Even although we are we have been using laser, but such extensive laser and well scope and other modalities, I think uh, today's presentation has been really, really good. And uh, we, I look forward for that uh, conference in September. I'm definitely going to attend that. And maybe we learn and then we'll, maybe we can organize a workshop on this at, at Delhi at somewhere. Dr. Malika is here in Delhi. We'll take her help and maybe we can, uh, because this is something going to be really helpful at the periphery as well, where if there's some uh, local doctors can be trained. And uh, the community work that oral cancers needs to be treated. And when we are treating oral cancer, everyone has to be part of it. So uh, thank you so much. I stop this, uh, say, stop this panel discussion and hand it over to thank the- you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks to all the panelists and our academic chairperson, Dr. Ganesh, uh, sir, for this wonderful and terrific, I mean, and Pavan, sir, for this uh, terrific, uh, panel discussion for the evening for day two. I now invite our academic director, Dr. Reena Ma'am, uh, to finally take this uh, session ahead to talk about the I Can Care Academy and uh, close this session for the evening. Thank you so much, Shruti. Uh, yeah, before that, can we can you please uh, put the uh, Facebook page so that everyone can join the Facebook page? Before we uh, sure, sir, we'll do that. But people have been asking this. Just give me a moment. I think my battery is running low. Let me just plug it in. Here's the community link. I'm dropping it uh, for all our audiences here. I'll request each one of you to please join the community page to stay connected and also to have the answer to the quiz. And the uh, lucky five lucky winners will also be declared uh, towards the end of the day on the Facebook community page. Thank you very much, Shruti. So before I go on to the academy, so I would like to just discuss about today's uh, event that we had. If you could stop sharing the screen, it would be nice if I just see everybody. So I thank every one of you. You know, what an evening it's been. Really, what an evening. It's been a fantastic evening. And in this month where we have been having the third edition of our uh, in international e-conclave on the over oral cancer awareness. So what happens is that this is the second uh, second session today. Yes, we are in total agreement that uh, surveillance, early detection, look for it, don't let it pass, create awareness, all of it is there. But we all also agree that where are we failing? We are failing because we are not catching them early. We are having a high recurrence rate and we are having a diagnosis, which is, you know, somewhere along, we are not sure, you know, we're kind of in whatever way it's inaccurate or we're not sure about our accuracies and we do not know how to follow up and the surveillance. So it's been a wonderful uh, session starting out right before I before I do the academic part. Let me first doc thank Dr. Rashi for the wonderful quiz that she conducted as a quiz master. You did a great job. It was fantastic. And we had about 60 participants who took part in this quiz. And I think everybody heard about the wonderful prizes which are awaiting. And uh, that's one part of it. So the evening which started out today with Dr. Birur, Dr. Yavagul and of course Malika, Dr. Malika's coming out with so many issues, you know. So what we have come to and after this panel discussion, what we understand is there is space for everybody and there's a space for everything. So there is a space for your pure, you know, looking at your eyes, using your eyes, using your fingers and uh, using your mouth mirror probe, as we say, and using your even a tongue blade or whatever you have. 
there is a space for everything. But efficiency, efficacy, sensitivity, or whatever we are using, how useful is that is what is to be seen. Technology has to be embraced. There is a space for technology and oral cancers, we are the king and we are well leading in our part of the country. So the government cannot back out. We who have the ability cannot back out. We must embrace new technology. The role of MI and ML with machine learning and what we have heard and with telemedicine and telemedicine society is somebody who has partnered with us you know, for this particular uh, event. Uh, how far we can take it and how deep we can take it and bringing everybody in the ambit whether it is a healthcare worker to every, uh, to, to whether it's you know ASHA worker at a ground level, a community health worker, or whether it is any one of us sitting in the most elite hospitals or in our own personal clinics, have a role to play, embrace technology, move ahead, get into the thing and do it right and do it, definitely do it, but do it right. So to do it right, we have various things. And yes, I think uh, the role of lasers in different ways cannot be understated. And most importantly, today, what I learned about, uh, you know, from Dr. Evagal, I must say I learned about how beautifully you can use the plyoid because that is a role which, uh, yes, this, you know, the scale scraping and this brush technology biopsy, I had heard about it, but I did not know how well you could use it. And the current thing is, if you can avoid, there's no patient who wants to, I'm sorry for all the oncosurgeons and head and neck surgeons here. There's nobody who wants a knife. There's nobody who wants their tongue cut. There's nobody who wants the jaw cut. There's nobody who wants any of that. So if we can do something and prevent it and find a diagnosis and surveillance, a way to find a surveillance, because I think this plyoidy is what I have seen is a surveillance mode. It's a great mode for surveillance because how do you follow these patients up? How do you go about making sure that they don't kind of recur? Because we just heard from Malika also about the recurrence. All of us are concerned about how it's spreading out, what's really happening. So I think it's a great learning, but most importantly, all of us together, all the time, for our patients, for the community. That should be our motto. Because very well said by our uh, oncosurgeons and our uh, medical colleagues here who have said, yes, we need to learn more what the dental surgeons are doing and more what, you know, and at I Can Care, we always, I'm very fortunate. I'm a very important part of academic academy. And for me, this is very heartening to say that dental surgeons have a very, very important role in our thought process with Dr. Pavan heading it. The academy holds great respect for the role of dental surgeons in early diagnosis and, you know, let's say surveillance and how we can do early management too for a better prognostic outcome for our patients and for the community at large. And of course, tobacco cessation. So now I'll tell you about our academy, what we do. Shruti, you can put up the slides if you'd like to. So we are very fortunate to have Gujarat University, who has also partnered with us today for this event. Shruti, can I have the slides, please? Thank you. Yeah. So uh, Gujarat University is very much a part where we are, uh, not this one, this doesn't matter. <laughs> Let's have that about, yes. So we, we believe that education is the way and the only way ahead, because whether we are educating the woman in the house such that she's creating better health facilities and the you know making sure that the husband the brother-in-law the son or whatever whoever it is is not either not going to touch tobacco or making sure they're moving for tobacco cessation so whether it's educating the women where we have the tobacco marshals right and we have tobacco marshals at all levels because that is actually the capacity we are looking at where we are looking to educate youth for sensitization, that be smart, do not start. That's a very important part of our Save the Youth campaign. We believe in bringing everybody in into this volunteer business. And the second thing is about the tobacco marshals. The tobacco marshals is a training program, and it is a, a unique program started by I Can Care, where at the academy, we train anybody. There is no cure qualifications required. You just need to have the passion in your heart. You have to have the passion, you have to have the calling, and just come forward. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a grandmother, whether you're a society leader, or whether you are a student, it doesn't matter who. But come forward, learn everything about tobacco, learn how to speak about tobacco, learn about how you're going to be able to talk about the risks, the rewards, the benefits, you know, the court par laws. So then these are the people who are actually there in every, we want them to percolate in every corporate society, in every RWA in every school, in every educational institution, we want that they should be there in every club, in every walk of society. 
And that is where our marshals or our foot soldiers are. The other two programs, we are fortunate that we have the Gujarat University accreditation and the certification come from Gujarat University. So that is the ambassador program, wherein we call the OCTC. So the OCTC program is a one month long, four week long program, a two hours. Uh, so it's two hours per, per week. And that's how it goes on for four weeks, right? And it is a learning. So it's an intermediate level program where we are inviting all healthcare professionals to come forward and to learn the, you know, the mid level of understanding how to actually look at our protocol and embrace our protocol. We have a protocol which is scientifically validated. And today we heard Dr. Biru talk about a mobile app. And we are fortunate that at I Can Care, we have a wellness app, which is our I Can Care app, which has multiple functions because it's a motivator for the patient. Patient has so many learnings that it can, they can, because we know that the most difficult part of our tobacco cessation is getting the patient from pre-contemplation to contemplation. And this is what our app can actually do because it has numerous things built into it. It empowers the patient to actually take on because many times they're hesitant to come and talk to a doctor or to go to anybody for that matter because they probably don't believe in anybody. The other is, of course, for the doctor or the counselor and the counselor. So all three and how it can be interrelated and how it picks up the, and it is again run by AIML and what our learnings are from that. You can even be have an e-pharmacy so the patient can order their own medications. We can put in our own medications and that, choose from what is there in the pharmacy or introduce what we would like to introduce. The other one, of course, is our flagship program, which we call is the CTCS, is the Certified Tobacco Cessation Program. We invite every one of us, every one of us to make sure that in the community, we spread the word and let everybody come and be a Certified Tobacco Cessation Specialist. And I'm proud to be one. I'm an orthodontist and I'm proud to be one because I did not know how to handle my patients with obstructive sleep apnea. I work in sleep apnea. And it is this tobacco cessation course which has actually put three of my practices in a great place. One as a personal uh, uh, you know, commitment to society, as a healthcare professional, as a dental surgeon, and importantly, you know, when I work in the sleep medicine forum. So I, uh, with this, I would like to invite all of you to come and send your associates, your juniors, your colleagues, spread the word such that to understand that only together, whether we are from whichever speciality, it does not matter. Like we have trained, we have more than a thousand marshals, thousand plus marshals we have got trained now, and we are looking to train many more. We have another group of people called the mini marshals where they get a smaller kind of training, but not fully equipped. They are developing to become marshals. The number of OCTC, now here I would like to talk about our orientation course and thank Bajaj Electrical Foundation because uh, Bajaj Electrical Foundation realized the importance of what we are doing. And with Gujarat University validating our course, they realized that this is somewhere there's a gap to be filled. There's a huge gap of healthcare professionals who need to be skilled up and scaled up. We need to create that, that area where if the patient, because every one of our uh, of our uh, faculty that we have had so far or we've had today talk about tobacco cessation, but how many really know how to do it? So that is where I Can Care Academy is coming in with the help of Gujarat University validated course that we fill that skill gap. Invite you once more to please come and be a part of our academy in every way possible. Be a faculty, be a trainer, please contribute as a guest faculty. And we would definitely like to invite each and one, every one of you to come in and present a deli and deliberate and give a, 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 guest, a guest lecture for in our uh, CTCS course. Shruti, is there another slide that you'd like to show me? The next one, yes. So I just talked about this and these very wonderful certificates that you have that we can give them to you, give them to our participants to actually showcase because you know the patient needs to know that I am I am somebody they can have a confidence on because here I am speaking the language. I'm actually giving them that conviction and, and uh, the commitment that I have all the knowledge which I'm going to be able to handhold you through all your problems while the certificate on the wall speaks for that. I thank each and every one of you. This is an incredible product that we have. This is a Make in India product with Gujarat University and I Can Care collaborated, designed purely by Dr. Pavan Gupta. And we have talked about this in so many ways and has gone through its improvisations. It's an amazing product because it's very easy to carry. 
just goes into a small little case, almost looks like a spectacle case. A patient can just carry it. It's a personalized device, easy, easy to clean, easy to you know, uh, maintain it. And of course, calibratable, can be calibrated, has the potential of not slipping because it has certain built-in indentations and all by which the patient, we are looking at the TMJ, maintaining the TM joint and maintaining the, uh, the alignment and the spatial alignment of the maxillomandibular relationship while we are looking at how to do the vertical, uh, you know, uh, exercising of the uh, musculatures. So uh, on behalf of I Can Care, Gujarat University, uh, FNHO, Sterling Hospitals and Telemedicine. I thank each and every one of you, our faculty, our guest speakers, our panelists, our, you know, our wonderful quiz master, and most importantly, all our audience who have kept our motivation really high throughout and making us want to be where we are and join hands and let's join hands and do it, but do it, do it best and do it right. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the wonderful talk. I'm sure that a lot of us would really want to join the Akinkar Academy and be the succession experts over in India. I think we had a great day today, a great learning, a lot of new deliberations which has happened in the session. In the next session, the next episode is scheduled for next Sunday, 23rd of uh, April, between 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. I invite all our audience once again to join us for the next episode on day three, uh, next Sunday. Till then, have a wonderful weekend. Have a great time ahead. Have a great session ahead. I'm dropping the review link uh, on, the, on the chat box. I'll request uh, if all of you can quickly give us a, a review on the Google page. That helps us to keep growing and uh, to, to uh, deliver a lot more new things and to improve ourselves. For those audiences who are there with us on YouTube and Facebook, I'll request to please put down your full name and email address uh, on the I Can Care uh, community page or otherwise uh, send us a message on the every page of I Can Care so that we can send out their participation certificates to you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful time. Enjoy. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining in.